Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Fontanaza, editor of Food Safety Tech, and I'll be your host for today's virtual event, which is the final in our 2021 series on food safety hazards, with this specific event focusing on physical hazards. Today's event has been sponsored by PNP Optica. So before I welcome the speakers, I'm just going to review some housekeeping items. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you have problems with the audio, please try to increase your computer's volume. If you still continue to have issues, log out and try to reconnect. Contact Veronica Allen via the chat box if any technology problems persist. Today's event will consist of three educational presentations and a tech talk by our sponsor, PNP Optica. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send them in at any time during each session block. We'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session after each presentation. You can download the presentations and your certificate of participation from the handouts pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Please make sure to download the files during the webinar as they will not be emailed after today's event. If you're using a handheld device, please select the note symbol. And we'll also have a interactive poll at the end of PNP Optica's Tech Talk, so we also encourage you to participate in that as well. So now I'm pleased to welcome and introduce our first speaker, Sean Stevens, food safety attorney and founder of Food Industry Council. Sean is a prolific contributor to our virtual and in-person events. It's always a pleasure to have you, Sean. He's also a member of our editorial advisory board. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much, Maria. Um, and it's great to be um, here today with, um, with the audience. This is really um, a fabulous, fabulous topic. Um, uh, that we're addressing today, which is foreign material contamination in food. And it it creates all sorts of issues and problems, of course, for us as food manufacturers, um, trying to produce a safe product and avoid the scrutiny of USDA and FDA. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, bad things do happen. Um, so if we'll take a look, you know, I had, um, <clears throat> I had originally thought about, uh, and I did a Google search, um, having the picture of a fingertip chopped off of a, a hand uh, on this opening slide, and I, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, there's some really horrific imagery uh, on the internet, um, and it, it, I had to get, I had to get out of that search as fast as possible, and I didn't want to put you through, put you through the, uh, the same uh, disgust that I felt when I, when I did that search. So we, we do have a hand here. It's, it's cut. But that's okay because in addition to foods being recalled uh, historically for foreign materials, including fingertips, um, there's also been recalls for, for human blood. So I thought this photo was maybe just a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier to <clears throat> swallow. So uh, since 2000 and 2021, there have been um, approximately 793 recalls uh, for the existence of foreign materials, foreign objects. Uh, in food products, 793. That represents a little less than 10% of all recalls um, uh, since the year 2000. And what we're going to see is uh, around 2012, there was a huge jump in the number of annual recalls for foreign materials. We can talk a little bit about why that may be. But the one thing that we do know for certain, especially for those of us who have uh, lived through uh, foreign material recalls, uh, is that they create massive headaches, right? Um, 793 massive headaches because of foreign materials that should not have been in a food product in the last uh, 20 or so 20 or so years. And what what are we talking about, right? When we talk about foreign materials, what what is sort of the the universe of things that can find their way other than pathogens and chemicals and pesticides? What are the different objects we we find in food products? Well. I have a sampling right here. This is actually the most uh, often occurring um, uh, uh, foreign materials that will find it find their way into foods, from glass to rubber gaskets and equipment uh, to plastic, uh, metal, uh, calculator buttons. Uh, insects, of course, are a big one. Golf balls like to find their their way into potato products pretty frequently. Uh, blood, rocks, uh, even parts of a bird. 
and what I, just, I what I thought would be fun to do is we look at all of these different objects that can get into food is to rank them and see which ones because it'll help us you know on a daily basis as we make decisions with respect to what is the risk of a particular foreign material making its way into my food is it reasonably likely for me to expect bird parts in my incoming ingredients maybe not but it does happen um, so when we look at the rankings we see that oh and there are a number I should say a number of um, foreign material recalls where we don't know what the foreign materials were because um, they're not specified, right? So in the information that we have on the recall notices, the class twos and class threes, um, the foreign materials in some cases aren't specified, but we'll, we'll look at the rankings. Um, number one here is plastic. Plastic is the number one foreign material that makes its way into food products. Um, it, a lot of reasons for it. A lot of packaging is made out of plastic. Um, and uh, pens are made out of plastic and frequently dropped into food products. So plastic is, is our, our leading cause. Uh, number two is metal, metal shavings. Uh, most often metal comes from the processing equipment, of course. If it's run um, uh, and not maintained appropriately, there can be failures where we see um, metal forming in, 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 or metal finding its way into our food products. Uh, number three is glass. Glass is number three. Uh, number four, unspecified. So the fourth leading cause of foreign materials are foreign materials that have not, have not been specified by, by the agencies, USDA or, or FDA. Uh, number five, insects uh, is the fifth leading cause for foreign things in food products. Six is rocks. Seven is gaskets or rubber, rubber, usually in the form of gaskets that'll fail on, on food processing equipment. Uh, number eight, uh, uh, rodents, uh, evidence of rodent activity, whether it's rodent droppings in the cereal or um, evidence of mice climbing in and out of packages of, of food. Um, number nine, wood. Wood will occasionally find its way into food products through various of uh, various mechanisms. Number 10 is fabric. Uh, number 11 is blood. And believe it or not, the 12th leading cause of foreign materials and food products is fingertips. Um, and then the rest, of course, uh, bird parts, bones, calculator buttons um, would fall, I guess, into the 13th category, kind of miscellaneous. Um, so this is a, a chart that depicts the total recalls um, for, since 2003. And what we're going to do is I'm going to overlay on this the total recalls for foreign materials during the same period so we can see um, how foreign material recalls track total recalls. But this is total recalls of all uh, FDA and USDA products. And we're on track this year. I predicted a little bit earlier this year, we, we'd probably, we'd likely hit 480. Um, we're at 475 right now. So there's a good chance we may make it into the 490s, which you can see is a huge jump back up the other way from the trend that we were, we were following, which was a decrease in overall total recalls over the last uh, couple of years. Um, I'm overlaying uh, FDA recalls on the total now. So you see FDA tracks pretty darn closely um, uh, to the total recalls because most food products being recalled are FDA regulated products, right? It's just a lot more of them out there. And then we can overlay the USDA recalls and we see there's far fewer uh, recalls for USDA products, but um, still, still the numbers remain significant with a, a big drop recently. Now PCA of course accounts for the huge spike in 2009. Uh, FISMA, um, uh, the the introduction of the uh, legislation, the writing of the regulations, of course, FDA taking a much more aggressive stance with respect to ensuring safety in the food supply, uh, given the new authorities and grants of power it was issued uh, in 2011. Seeing in 2012, we saw the recalls begin to kind of tick up. And then of course, the, the year of the Swabathon 2016, we topped out the top tip of the mountain was 820. And then a huge drop here more recently because of COVID. New focus, right? COVID management, uh, food safety uh, didn't fall away, but you know it was one of many things now that a lot of folks, um, QA, uh, regulatory folks, food science folks had to had to also deal with. Um, and of course, FDA hasn't been in the facilities uh, conducting routine inspections because of COVID concerns. But that is all about to change. We ask what comes next, and here we can do be a little bit predictive. Um, you know, if we predict. You know, 480, we'll probably hit that 490 recalls by the end of this year. Likely, I expect to see 560 or so next year. Um, I think the year after that, the numbers are going to continue to increase as uh, FDA begins to visit more facilities, conduct more inspections, and um, our focus um, continues to 
uh, tighten, right, on food safety uh, because of the visibility that it's been given over the course of the last um, 15, 10, and five years. And of course, I think we're going to uh, begin to see our numbers uh, actually all pacing where we were in 2016, probably in just a few years. So that, you know, what goes down must come up or usually will come up. Um, and I expect to see this trend is we uh, we see a, a spike of recalls on the horizon. Again, we're we're going to hit almost 500 this year. And that's that trajectory is up, not not down. Um, so let's take a look and see uh, if we could what that what the total look, recalls look like when compared against foreign material recalls. And the numbers were were as I as I kind of worked through the data and and extracted the numbers were interesting to me. Um, you know, we see down below there some relatively few number of recalls for foreign objects um, in the early 2000s, and then a relatively significant spike in you know between 2011 and 2012. And this is what it you know looks like sideways. Um, 11, 20, 8, 8, 11, 11, 10, 11, 16. When we get to 2012, something drastic happened. Um, and I'm not, I'm not certain what the explanation is. It could be that more and more companies um, were investing in and putting uh, uh, metal detection on the line, right? This is the same year that FISMA was, was written um, and signed into law. Uh, more companies perhaps were, not, for the first time ever, treating foreign materials as a hazard for which a control was required and therefore put interventions in place to ensure that that hazard was being controlled for, right? Whether it was x-ray or um, metal detection. Any event, we see a massive jump in 2012 in the numbers of recalls for foreign materials spiking in 2019 at 105, but we kind of see, you know, a decrease in 2020. Um, a little bit of an increase so far this year as the trend starts going back up. And if we want to be predictive here too, I expect that we are going to see an increasing number of um, recalls for foreign materials moving forward. Now, remember, even if you have in your facility everything under control, your, suppl your suppliers may not, right? So this is an issue that impacts all of us regardless, regardless of um, how strong our own systems are. We may find ourselves producing a whole lot of product using a supplier's raw materials um, and, <clears throat> and not discover the existence of contamination in a particular lot until we've got a lot of finished products already manufactured and packaged in their final packaging. Um, so this is where I predict I see us going um, more and more recalls and as new technologies are brought online um, uh, and more companies begin using technologies such as X-ray. Uh, a lot of the contamination that avoided detection previously, right, through metal detection or mag magnets perhaps, um, are going to be detected, right? And I expect we're gonna see a lot more recalls happening as X-ray um, is employed increasingly in, in, in different facilities. Here's just some examples. Some of you may have seen this of some recalls. I call them bad foreign material days. Uh, hydraulic flu fluid at ground beef in 2005. I was involved in that recall. It was a very slippery situation. Um, somebody found a bird head in a can of pinto beans in 2006. Uh, diesel fuel in seasoned turnips, um, seasoned diesel flavored turnips. Fingertip found in a potato scramble breakfast in 2015. I bet everybody scrambled from the breakfast table when they found the fingertip. I would have uh, golf balls and hash browns in 2015. More fingertips showing up. Remember the 12th leading cause of recalls here in the United States involving foreign materials. This time in donuts and cinnamon rolls, um, blood and taffy. It was human flavored taffy, not cherry. Shredded golf balls in 2017. Then in 2019, my favorite chocolate cake, somebody found a bird foot. And we'll leave you <clears throat> uh, with this, this image. So what is the, um, what is the you know, leading causes of form material recalls or events? Uh, I think, you know, right at the top is the lack of employee training. Um, employees, unfortunately, in many cases, it, you know, they don't understand the significance of a foreign material getting into a product. Tearing open plastic bags full of frozen onions, right, to dump into a hopper, and they're a little sloppy, and some plastic ends up in the hopper. Well, okay, we, we lost a little bit of plastic, so what? What the employee doesn't understand in many cases is that plastic, that little bit of plastic could result in a recall that costs millions of dollars. 
at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, millions of dollars, depending on the size, right, of the batches or the lots that are being manufactured. The other thing I think that leads um, the cause of, of, of recalls for foreign materials is employee fear. Employees fearful that maybe they made a mistake. Oops, they get back to the QA office and they're, they're missing their pen, right? Nobody knows where it went right now. Um, and instead of coming forward and saying, listen, uh, I, I'm sorry, I lost my pen, uh, and being able to stop production, right? Stop the line, try to figure it out. Um, and maybe we find the pen parts um, before it's too late. But if we start receiving telephone calls from customers, right? Who are finding parts of pens in their, in their food, well now um, uh, we may be in a recall situation. So it's very important, I think, for employees, us, to help employees um, have a comfort level that we would much rather hear about a mistake right now, right? So we can correct it for maybe a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, as opposed to not telling anybody about something they saw or did, and it cost the company hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. Um, the third, I think, leading cause is lack of preventive maintenance. You know, you've got uh, equipment that is, um, you know, it has gaskets, it, they have parts, um, they need to be inspected and, and replaced. Um, a lot of gaskets have best buy dates, right? Replace this a gasket after six months or 12 months or 18 months. And many companies, that maintenance isn't being done. Rather, the equipment is being run to failure, right? We'll just run it. Um, and in many cases, super hard when we think about the volumes, right? Until um, something busts or something breaks. And then we'll, we'll send in the maintenance folks to make the repairs and, um, and we'll do it all over again, right? But the millions of dollars of product that is thrown away every year because of equipment failures could probably be used to, to actually buy a little bit of or pay for a little bit of preventive maintenance. Um, so maybe not in the end, the company saves money. So uh, what should you do if you find yourself in a potential recall situation? I get a call, somebody found a bird foot, right? In, 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 in their cake, there's complaints. FDA is now involved. Maybe they're not yet involved, but we're trying to figure out is a bird foot, the foot of a bird, something that is worthy of recalling a whole bunch of product is a recall required, right? Is that's a situation, that's a that's a question we ask in any situation involving a foreign material. Could be little tiny pebbles, it could be little pieces of metal, it could be flakes of plastic, right? Um, or something bigger like glass. But is a recall required? Well, the tool that we use, and I'm gonna just show this to the audience because it's extremely helpful, is our food recall reporter. Um, it's um, foodrecallreporter.com. Uh, uh, totally free. And what we do is when we find ourselves in circumstances where we're wondering, hmm, is recall required under these circumstances? It might not be a foreign material. It could be a pesticide. It could be a pathogen. It could be bloating cans, right? Um, or bloating packages. We'll just type in um, in the search box and it'll bring us to um, all of the recalls that have ever happened involving that particular instance. In this case, there is only one. Fortunately, thank goodness, one recall involving a bird foot. Now I've I've blocked out the company and brand here, but you can see details. It's a bird foot chocolate cake with cream cheese icing. The recall class, it's a class two. Thank goodness, public never had to hear about it, right? So that means there wasn't press. Recalling agency was FDA and the food type was human versus pet or animal. And we can dig in a little bit further by clicking into the um, into the um, data, and we see basically a details page here. Again, company and brand are are, um, are uh, redacted, and all the details: consumer complaints of bird foot found in the product uh, caused the recall of 45,366 pounds of cake. Um, class two, again, no um, no recall notice, but we do see we'll have a link as well to the FDA enforcement report, so you can see some additional details involving the recall and it'll help you make a decision at the end of the day whether a recall in these circumstances is warranted. Here we did a search for pen and you'll see over the last 20 years there's been um, there's been seven recalls for pens, parts of pens and food products. Uh, six were class two, one was class three. Thank goodness none were class one. Nobody ever had to hear about it. Uh, five involved FDA products, two were USDA products. So it's a really helpful tool um, when you're navigating um, uh, the recall, you know, decision tree, right? Um, what are we going to do? Uh, and 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 this is the coolest part. You can 
influence of SANS recall classification, right? Every recall is classified. Well, there's many cases where we've had clients who have had recall situations where the recall reporter was just bound and determined to classify what had happened as a, or recommend to SIFSAN that it, uh, what, what happened be classified as a class one recall. And for whatever reason, in those circumstances, um, in some of those circumstances, the company did not want um, there to be any press. Maybe the company was going public. Maybe it really wasn't a big issue and nobody wanted to alarm, right? Um, their customers or consumers. And what we can do is use the recall reporter to show that, look, um, Mr. or Mrs. Recall Coordinator, uh, yeah, we're getting complaints of pieces of a ballpoint pen, right, in our soup, but but in every single instance, historically, all seven of them, um, they've always been class two or class three, where the risk to consumer has been very low. You should follow that precedent. We'll tell you, um, FDA is one of the, the largest users of the recall reporter. Um, my sense is um, it's being used as a tool to help classified recalls based on historical precedent. What has the agency done in the past? Well, we can find out really quickly. Um, just a little plastic. Do small malleable pieces of plastic equate to adulteration? Here's a picture of a sample of sea salt. And there's little tiny shavings of polypropylene from a tarp. Um, it was ultimately determined uh, in the sea salt. And we would find about this many pieces of polypropylene in a 50 pound bag of salt. Well, unfortunately, there was a customer of this particular supplier who was making brine and found these little pieces in their filters. Um, at about the same time, USDA was walking through the facility and also saw these in the filters. USDA um, then informed FDA that there was plastic found in this product. Um, FDA inf informed the supplier an invest investigation was conducted and it, with these little tiny pieces were discovered in some bags. About a million bags at issue um, in this particular um, lot, or a million pounds, I'm sorry, a million pounds of salt at issue in this particular lot. And, and the cause was polypropylene tarps used to protect the salt from bird droppings while it was drying outside, right? Uh, and as the sun deteriorated the polypropylene, these little pieces flicked off. Now, health hazard assessment, there is no risk to consumers. There is no hazard to consumers. This is small, it's tiny, it's soft, it's not toxic, right? Nothing is going to happen if we ate a little bit of salt with some tiny pieces of polypropylene in it. Nevertheless, FDA was um, determined um, to ensure that this product was one way or the other um, uh, recalled. Uh, the you know the agency's take here, and we locked horn horns for multiple weeks uh, with the agency, and we ultimately negotiated a resolution with CIFSAN up at the highest levels. Um, but as this, as I call it negotiation, as this negotiation was playing out, um, we had FDA recall coordinators calling other recall coordinator, coordinators saying that the product had been recalled. It hadn't, right? The company had not recalled the product. It put a hold on everything that was in inventory. Um, but the recall coordinators then, the various districts went out and started asking the company's suppliers or customers if they had re received the recalled product. And I can imagine the confusion amongst the customers who were being told about a product that had never been recalled. And in, F in essence, the FDA was mandating a recall, um, which is not one of its powers. It does not have the authority to do that. Uh, eventually, um, this was classified by, by CIFSAN because the company did hold everything as a class three to the wholesale level, or you, know, you call it a market withdrawal or stock recovery. Um, but uh, you know the, the FDA will go to bet, will go to fight um, if you know small pieces of plastic are in a product, and, and the agency's position is plastic shouldn't be in, in food products. Now, th would this satisfy the definition of adulteration uh, under the federal statutes? Maybe not. Um, one might argue, but you know I don't think the agency would go out and seize product in the market for an issue such as this. Uh, point here, though, is is FDA is very stringent when it comes to things like small pieces of foreign materials in a food product, if they're not supposed to be there, the agency will expect the company to do something about it. Uh, larger pieces of plastic, still small, um, smallish, um, malleable. Of course, you know, this could, this could create a choking hazard. Um, but in the case here, it was interesting. We were able to, we got a really nice result with, with FDA. 
Um, the plastic was uh, in, a, in an ingredient that was sent to the manufacturer. The manufacturer used it to make a finished product, but it had lots of filters um, and various uh, inspections that would have likely detected the plastic. So while there is a chance that finished product could have made it into the market um, containing this plastic, the FDA allowed the company just to put on hold what was still in inventory um, and take you know action with respect to that, but leave everything else out uh, in the market. So that was a class... Uh, uh, in essence, uh, likely a, it'll come down as a class two um, uh, to the wholesale level once again. Uh, small pieces of metal, um, you know, this 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 is an, this is a example of something that happened recently where there was a handful of little tiny flecks of metal, um, no larger than a grain of sand. Unfortunately, some were lead. Um, although toxicologists and others agreed that there was no risk to humans, at least no acute risk. Um, one company, uh, the, 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 the customer who used uh, the ingredient at issue here to make finished products, recalled all their finished products. Um, the supplier, based on its health hazard, hazard assessment, decided there was no need. We're really talking about the gra a grain of sand um, and only just a handful. Um, and the agency was fine uh, with the product, product staying in the market. So every, every recall is different. Every circumstance is different. Um, and the agency will respond differently in, in different circumstances, depending on, I guess, who you're dealing with in the agency, who the um, recall uh, coordinator is, um, and whether or not, you know, they woke up on the wrong side of the bed uh, that particular day. But what's interesting here is there was many, many, many um, controls for foreign materials um, at the supplier level, uh, which uh, did not detect these little tiny specks of metal because um, they were too small. But the customer was using x-ray and um, really, really good x-ray and as a result found these. So I think we're increasingly, we're gonna see these scenarios where foreign materials that should be avoiding detection are in fact being detected by food companies and resulting in product actions, which I think will continue to increase and, and continue to um, cause this headaches, right, for the industry. Now, this isn't a foreign material, but as we wrap up here, um, this is a recall. You know, normally you hear about a recall and, and you're told throw away the product. This one was kind of cool. And um, many gummy butterflies, you know, you buy them for your kids. Well, these actually contained Ollie's sleep dietary supplements, which which will put you to sleep, right? And I heard about this recall. I didn't I didn't throw my gummy butterflies away. I went to the I went to the store and I bought even more because when you come home, right, after a long day dealing with a recall, right, a foreign material recall for little pieces of plastic that aren't going to make anybody sick, that's exactly what you feel like. You have this headache. And then on top of it, it's finally you get back from the office. It's 1030 at night. You're done sending out your notices to your customers. And all you want is a, a glass of wine and some aspirin, right? And the kids are jumping up and down on the couch and they're running around the house and they just won't, they won't shut up, right? Well, you can give them some of the gummy, gummy butterflies, right? And they work really well at, at putting them to sleep. And once you've taken care of the kids, if now I guess what? Your, your husband or your wife, your husband is, is now pestering you, right? Because the dishes aren't done or, you know, you got home so late and he missed his, his, his poker game, whatever the case may be. Well, guess what? Those little gummy butterflies work on work on uh, work on adults as well. So with that, um, I want to thank all of you for sitting in, um, talking a little bit about foreign materials. It's a really fascinating topic. I love to to scroll through the data, and hopefully, what we talked about here today and the insights we provided will um, serve as good tools for you and your organization as you as you press forward, making the safest possible food for all of us. And I thank you each for all that you do. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. Um, that's such an interesting presentation. And um, Sean presented on recalls during our consortium. And I do think I need to rethink when we have you present because it's right at lunchtime at the East, on the East Coast and you're talking about some pretty unappetizing but very important things. Um, so thank you for that. And so let's get started with the questions. We've got a few minutes. So if folks have them, please do feel free to send them into the um, questions pane of the control panel. Um, so here's uh, one question on just kind of confirming something regarding FISMA. Under FISMA, does the FDA have the power to mandate a recall even if a company refuses? Um, the, yeah, yes and no. Uh, so if 
uh, let's say there's small pieces of malleable plastic in salt and the company and the FDA is aware of it. And the FDA says what the FDA will always say, what are you going to do about it? Right. Um, the company in that case, if the company were to say, listen, FDA, um, there's, there's no health hazard here. Um, they're tiny minuscule pieces of plastic. Um, and as a result, we don't believe that any action is required under these circumstances. Um, the agency in that, in that case would not be able to uh, compel a recall because it only has mandatory recall authority if the use or consumption of the product is reasonably likely to um, cause adverse health consequences or death. That, that's not occurring here, so the agency wouldn't have the power. Now, if it was listeria in uh, ready-to-eat sandwiches, then the agency would have the power to compel that company and force a recall because somebody could get hurt. Now, the agency, if it's really perturbed and it thinks it can win on the argument of whether uh, tiny pieces of plastic, harmful plastic in salt is, adulterates that salt and makes it adulterated, the agency could um, uh, seek an injunction or um, seize the product uh, from the market and then take um, uh, additional action against the company itself. But pretty unlikely in this scenario, I think, you know, FDA would would um, would seize product and, you know, have its people pull it from the shelves. Uh, but, you know, you never know. So each case is different and each, um, you know, decision making process has to take account all of the potential risk. Okay, very good. And what are the penalties for not recalling a contaminated product? Right. So, um, you know, if it's, um, it's a crime to knowingly ship adulterated products into commerce. Um, so, you know, conceivably, uh, the agency could bring potential criminal sanctions against the company. Um, things get really start to heat up if, let's say, there's glass, evidence of complaints of glass in a product. Glass could harm a consumer, could lacerate his or her throat or intestines. Um, in that case, if um, consumers actually consumed the product and became injured, uh, and maybe somebody died, and the company was aware that that product, adulterated product, was in commerce and failed to take action, that's when DOJ could get involved. On top of the penalties that FDA could impose, DOJ could say, um, you know, you knew of a situation that could have hurt somebody. Um, you're in a position to correct the situation, issue a recall of the product, and, and put out press. And you failed to do so, therefore, um, you know, you're, you could be liable criminally um, in that case. So a lot of different considerations when we, you know, think about um, when we have an issue with the product and whether or not to recall. The advice I give um, in all cases, and sometimes the decision is hard because uh, it costs a lot of money. Um, but the advice I give is let's ask ourselves, what would 12 jurors think? And we'll always get to the right answer. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Here's an interesting one. Does a foreign body have to cause harm to be considered a physical exam, a physical hazard? And then as an example, this person is saying, such as something naturally occurring on a product like fish bone. Is that a physical ha hazard? Or is hair considered a physical hazard? Your thoughts? Yeah, so, um, well, first, does, does the object have to hurt somebody? No, um, it's just the reasonable probability that it will um or could uh foreign materials that are inherently natural to a product um are okay if the consumer would expect to find it in the product right so if meaning fish and there's a fish bone in it um that's okay but if i'm eating spaghettios and there's chicken bones in it right there shouldn't be any chickens anywhere near my spaghettios that that is a problem, right? And that could be deemed to be a hazard and um, something that um, adulterates the product because it's not supposed to be there. Okay. So we've got time for one more question. What are your remedies if the contamination originated from a supplier? Right. So um, in today's day and age, we're typically, you know, we're able to um, investigate thoroughly and determine whether if it's metal. It's metal that was present, you know, in our facility or part of our machinery, um, or if it's plastic, you know, is it plastic that shaved off of a conveyor belt, you know, that got jammed or 
offline um, or out of uh, alignment. Um, so in those cases, when we can figure out, okay, where it came from, um, there's lots of remedies available. Now, first off, ideally we have recall insurance, right? So if we're making a recall, we call the recall insurer, the recall insurer pays us whatever our losses are. And then we, and the insurer probably piggybacking on us, will go after the supplier or can go after a supplier um, for, if it's us, it's our uninsured losses, right? It might've been a $2 million policy and I've got a $5 million loss. So I got to recover that $3 million from the, from the supplier. Um, and the supplier may have insurance and you can likely get a negotiated settlement with the supplier's insurer. They'll fight you, I promise. They'll fight hard, but um, yeah, usually a claim against the supplier and with enough pressure, um, in most cases, we can get them to compensate um, our, our clients for their loss and make them whole. Okay, great. So what would 12 jurors think? That's always a great takeaway. Before we say our goodbyes to you, do you have any other takeaways that you want to leave with attendees today? You know, I think it's just um, what, when it comes to foreign materials, we're just, you know, operations sometimes outpaces food safety, the food safety group. And sometimes we gotta just like take a lasso and throw it around operations neck and tell them to slow down a little bit. Um, preventative maintenance, let's make sure that we're replacing parts on a routine basis. Don't run the equipment to failure, right? Build in time to shut it down so we can make sure it's maintained and we don't end up in these crazy circumstances. And we're gonna have to do it increasingly as more x-ray comes online. Um, it's gonna cost a lot of companies a lot of money, right? If we don't pay more attention to preventative maintenance. And I would say, since everybody else is doing it, it may be time to start thinking about x-ray yourselves. Okay, very good. Well, with that, thank you, Sean. Thanks for spending some time with us today. It's always a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. And now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Casey Gallimore. She is the Director of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs for the North American Meat Institute. Casey, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Maria. I'm excited to be here um, and really great segue from, from Sean's presentation. Um, so uh, I look forward to, to building on, on where he started us. And we're going to talk, um, we're going to focus mostly on what to do after you've had a foreign material incident. Um, and just for a quick background on me, I started out um, over 10 years ago in the food industry and chocolate and cereal ingredients. And then I moved to uh, a primarily a state cutting operation and then pork slaughter. Um, and then I joined the Meat Institute about four years ago. I'm not going to touch too much on recalls. Obviously, we had a great presentation from Sean. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm solely in the meat and poultry space. Um, so that's where my focus is. And um, in 2019, uh, the meat and poultry industry hit our record high uh, for the number of recalls for foreign material. We were at 27% um, of all recalls that year um, were for foreign material, which was 34 um, and it's still one of our higher reasons for a recall, though um, I'm, I'm happy to say numbers have gone down. Um, my ask uh, for my industry, as well as all of you all today, is let's try and prove Sean wrong and not, uh, not uh, see those, those, those records um, be beaten anytime soon. Um, so our industry kind of had a wake up call um, in, in needing to go back and focus on foreign material. And there's a lot of, you know, like Sean talked about, there's a lot of um, things that could have influenced having more recalls, you know, such as more focus from regulators, changes in, in policy initiatives, things like that. But at the end of the day, um, our industry recognized that there was just too much foreign material. Um, and so instead of focusing on, on why, the, why recalls had increased, we could just focus on, on the one main thing, which is to reduce the occurrence of foreign material in meat and poultry products. So this was an industry-wide effort um, uh, by the Meat Institute and our partnering organizations across meat and poultry. And the, the first couple of things that we talked about when we sat down to, to figure out how to tackle foreign material is, well, there's, there's two kind of main buckets that things fall in. And, and Sean did a great job of, of shaping this up for us. Um, things break or things get lost. So we either need to break less things or we need to manage things so they don't get lost. And those kind of easily broke out into two projects. And those, though these two projects um, will not solve all of those problems, uh, we hope that uh, they are a really good start. Um, so many of you might be familiar with our sanitary equipment design principles that have been in place for a long time. Though they're designed for the meat and poultry industry, they have been used um, across a lot of industries and are very applicable 
um, to those using like a wet cleaning uh, type of operation. So one of the projects we wanted to take on was updating those sanitary design principles that were really focused originally on tackling hysteria monocytogenies and ready to eat environments and expanding that to cover all food safety hazard with a specific uh, focus on foreign material. And so that document was released uh, earlier this year. Uh, and so that, and that's publicly available. There's a link here if you um, download the handouts. Uh, I highly encourage you to check those out. Like I said, they are, although they are designed for the meat and poultry industry, they do have um, applications outside. And then the other project that we worked on um, was to manage the thing. Um, again, you know, designing equipment to reduce uh, the likelihood that it's going to break and cause foreign material is a great effort. Um, but at the end of the day, we also need to manage things for when things do break or to prevent things from, from getting lost. So that was our uh, second project. Uh, and that's the one I'm going to focus on today. And again, this is also a publicly available document that was released um, in August of 2021. Uh, so it's, a, it's only a couple months old. I uh, highly encourage you to check it out. Again, this document is um, was specifically designed for the meat and poultry industry, but I do think it has a lot of application um, in other industries, especially on the section that we're going to focus on today. Um, so the manual is, is really designed around three main principles that we can prevent foreign material from ever occurring, we can detect it um, when it does occur, um, and then we can respond when we have an incident. Um, and it's, it's timely uh, that we put this foreign material manual out this year. Um, those of you that are unaware, the meat and poultry industry has put out what we call our protein pact for the people, animals, and climate of tomorrow. Um, and we have five different focus areas um, for a sustainability effort to help increase um, trust uh, in consumers in protein products. And one of those, um, obviously, is, is around food safety. Um, and we've identified that uh, foreign material control and prevention um, is going to be a measure for our industry for continuous improvement uh, in the area of food safety. So this manual, we hope, will help our members and hopefully others um, reach that goal. And it's really important to kind of understand the context of this, this document um, if, you're, if you're going to reach out and use it. Um, and part of why I say that is because um, we live in the USDA FSIS regulated space, um, which obviously is, is a little bit different from the FDA world. Um, and we don't want anyone to think that this document is a typical best practice document. It is very comprehensive. I believe the, the document's 94 pages long. Um, so if you were trying to do every single thing in the manual, you would do nothing else but try and try and handle foreign material. Um, but it's designed to be more like a reference document. So if you're looking for ideas or ways to improve your program, you could go through here and, and look for options. Um, and not everything in the manual will apply in every product or every facility even. Um, but it's, it's hopefully a really good resource for folks to use um, when creating their own internal program. And Sean mentioned this a little bit too, um, what is our definition of foreign material? Uh, it was very important for us in the meat and poultry industry, again, we're, we're working with live animals through slaughter, um, you know, hair, animal hair, um, bone, cartilage, uh, things like that is not what we're focused on in this manual, though some of the things that we talk about may help control for things like that. Uh, we were focused on more, um, more typical uh, foreign material that you would expect to find um, through food processing, things like metal, plastic, glass, fabric, string. So like I said, the manual is very comprehensive. Um, these are kind of the main sections. I'm not going to go into detail all those. We're going to go focus um, solely uh, on the uh, response section today. But the rest of this is out there for those of you that might be interested. <clears throat> So on the response section, um, this is very, this seems like a lot of steps um, for an ind individual response to a foreign material incident. But what I want to highlight here is some or all of these may be happening at the exact same time, and not all of these will necessarily be applicable in every situation. And, you know, in, in our industry and, and what we believe is fairly transferable to, to other industries, um, our goal is to reduce foreign material incidents. Uh, I think we've had to reframe our thoughts on foreign material as a, it can never, ever, ever happen. It's probably going to happen. 
Um, it's and unfortunately, it's just part of doing business um, in food processing. There's a lot of moving parts. We're working with raw agricultural products many times. Um, for materials, probably going to happen, but we can at least focus on high risk situations and reducing the number of times that we see incidents. I think it's helpful um, to break apart what an incident is because um, I think it really helps delineate how you're going to respond to it. So what we defined was two different buckets um, for an incident. You either have an event, something happened that made you think there might be four material in the product. You had a, a belt break, you had some kind of equipment failure, you had an employee report a missing glove versus a finding where you actually know that there was foreign material already in the product because you found it either internally or externally. So an inspection personnel, um, found something uh, in product, an x-ray machine found something in product, um, or heaven forbid, a customer or consumer found something. The biggest piece of advice, um, quick and dirty piece of advice that I can give you is make sure you're actually missing something before you go into a full-fledged response. Um, I used to call this um, our, our puzzling uh, uh, demonstration when I worked in plants. Um, but you would be amazed at the number of things that we have puzzled back together over the years to confirm whether or not we're missing anything. And if we are missing something, to make sure we really understand what we're looking for. So for instance, I had an, I had an incident uh, many years ago where an employee's arm guard um, was much smaller than it should have been, um, and it burst uh, and shattered into a bunch of pieces uh, on a processing line. And the QA techs uh, in the area diligently found every single piece of this arm guard and we were able to piece it back together and confirm that it was all there and we didn't have to hold any product. So I highly encourage you to play a little, to, to get some people on your staff that are good at putting puzzles together and get those people to work. Make sure that you're missing something before you do a, a wild goose chase and make sure that if you are missing something, you know what you're missing. And then one of the one of the key things about a good response is having a response team. Um, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is have somebody who's in charge of saying, and something happened, we need to decide what our response is going to be, if any. Um, triage, uh, um, first thing, you know, your coordinator really should be in charge of saying, okay, is this a, is something that we need to, you know, really launch the, the response team for? Is this substantiated? Um, those kinds of questions. Typically, your coordinator is going to fall on the food safety or quality assurance staff. Um, so you're normally going to have some kind of FSQA involved. But I encourage you to have uh, folks on your response team from different departments, people like production that actually work in the area on a regular basis, sanitation personnel, especially if your sanitation personnel are different from your production personnel. Uh, maintenance individuals, even procurement. Again, like Sean mentioned, talking about um, maybe a foreign material came from a supplier. Having someone on the procurement team that understands, you know, the different uh, uh, supply relationships, and there may be others. Um, you know, I've had some very interesting um, insights from people in HR, for example. So definitely triage. Make sure you need. Or make sure you know who you need on your team. Keep a list of contact information and make sure you have backups. Make sure that people that are going to be involved in a response for a foreign material incident know that they're going to be doing that, have had a little bit of training, um, and have some kind of backup identified. Um, and mix it up. You don't have to have the same response or the same response team with every incident. So, you know, if you have um, something that you know was a mechanical failure, you definitely want maintenance there. You may not need procurement there. Um, and include the people that are boots on the ground. Include the person that works with a piece of equipment every day if you think that it's equipment involved. Um, include people um, who are down in the area um, where the incident may have happened. Um, it doesn't not just need to be management personnel. In fact, I find that it's often way more valuable to have the boots on the ground people um, than a management person. Um, the management is not necessarily going to be as familiar with the area in the sights and sounds and smells. And also consider relevant time periods. Um, did it happen on off shift? Are there completely different people on off shift? Um, for maintenance personnel, do you do different work on equipment over the weekend than you do during the week? So if you've got you know, weekend PMs, um, your maintenance staff that works on weekends is gonna know, know that much better than, than a maintenance person that works during the week. 
And once you know that you need to control product or you have reason to believe you may need to control product, um, determining scope is one of the most difficult things about for material incident. Um, our, our recommendation is always that if you are trying to decide what product to control, start with a big net. You can always narrow uh, the net after that, but um, you cannot, you cannot, it's very difficult to expand it. Um, so a lot of times we, we think about, um, you know, all the different aspects that would go into determining, you know, what product do I actually need to get my hands around? And the most difficult one is typically time. Um, so it's a little bit different than like a microbial hazard where you may have like specific lots already determined, you know, you have a, a, a robust program that tells you, you know, if, if I get a listeria positive, I know I have this product that I need to hold. Foreign material is often different for every single incident that happens, so your scope may not be as easy to determine. It may be a lot of a supply material, you know, you may have to be tracking down an entire raw material lot. It may be a production production shift. Um, it may be something that was identified um, at cleanup um, and, you know, cleanup to cleanup would be a, a good break. Um, there are some different things that you can do to help try and control and figure out what your window is. Um, you know, obviously monitoring, if you have some kind of monitoring that would have helped, going back to the last acceptable check is always a good way to start. Um, you can look at doing time studies. So if you have um, some kind of incident that happens at point A, um, you can do a time study to see how long it would take to get through your system to see if you need to hold product from a certain time period. Flow studies are also um, an option. These are a little bit easier to do, again, with microbial hazards. We have some, some good uh, scientific literature out there telling us what hazards, um, you know, like for example, in meat products, we know that E. coli kind of travels with the product, whereas listeria is a harbage um, bacteria. Again, a lot different with foreign material. You need to maybe see if you know this is the type of material that got introduced, um, will it move through with your product or is it going to stay and, get, and harbor somewhere and, and come off individually? And again, that's another situation where if you have a belt rubbing, if you have metal shavings coming off, um, you know, that may be a very different situation. Um, and when all else fails, if you can't figure out what your time time window is and you need a hard stop, initiate cleaning. Um, that's kind of the, the go-to uh, mechanism. It works somewhat and most of the time for microbial hazards. It can also work for, um, for foreign material depending on the situation. And then when you've decided that you need a control product and determine your scope, actually control the product. <laughs> um, I speak from experience when I say that you should use more than one type of hold. Um, visual holds, things like QA tape, hold tags um, are very helpful. Um, physical holds are extremely helpful, make the product physically unable for anyone to get to it. Um, this would be the absolute ideal situation if you had a giant cage to lock, and some people have done that. Um, if you put a uh, product on like a, a, a storage trailer and lock that up, um, and electronic holds can also be very useful. If you're using an electronic inventory system, if you can hold, most inventory systems will allow you to hold um, product within the system um, so that no one can scan it out. But my, again, please think about trying to use more than one. Um, one control is often not enough uh, to make sure the product stays. And then you start getting into your investigation. So this is when we're gonna go try and identify um, what really happened? Why did we have this, this foreign material um, incident? Um, the value of a hands-on, go look at your equipment, go look at your product, go, go in, look at your process cannot be overstated. Um, sitting in an office and looking at evidence is very different than seeing it down on the floor. Um, use area employees that know the area really, really well in combination with people that are fresh eyes and ears. Um, that's a, a huge help uh, sometimes. Interview people. Um, interview people that were in the area. Has there been any process changes? Was there someone out today um, that was no normally does a certain job? You know, was there somebody different doing um, a maintenance PM who maybe hasn't done it as many times? Were there any visitors in the area or anything else um, that's, that's unusual or different? And then do a records review. Um, HACCP and QA documents are not the only documents that are pertinent um, to production and to a foreign material incident. 
my biggest advice on document review is know what documents are out there in advance. Um, you know, go talk to maintenance about what their records look like. Go talk to production, sanitation, all the different departments to know what their records look like and take a look at them regularly. I learned more about what was going on in my facilities from maintenance and production pass downs than from any of my own FSQA documentation when I was uh, in FSQA. And then for external findings, documentation is, uh, is extremely important. Um, a lot of times uh, we don't get enough details about the product. Work with your customer service folks, your sales folks, or whoever it is that's going to be that initial person talking with the customer or consumer and have them uh, trained on getting as much information as possible. Information is key when we're trying to figure out the source of an issue. We need to know what the package said, what the description of the product is, What's the lot code or the date? Um, is there an establishment number or any other kind of uh, identifying number on the, on the package? Um, where do they buy the product? What, how, how were they using the product? Was it fully cooked? Did they already, um, did they just pull it out of the package? Is it still in the package? And then if at all possible, I encourage you to get the foreign material back from the consumer or the customer if you can especially if it's um, a customer relationship and it's not actually at the consumer level. This is typically a lot more achievable, um, especially if you have a great uh, relationship with your customers. Having the physical form material is critically important in identifying. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that we've looked at photos, you know, even a photo next to a ruler and something looks like what we like this, but then we get the physical object and, there are, and it, it's something completely different than what we thought it was. Um, and it's much easier to run tests if you have the physical form material. Things like Sean was talking about running um, tests on you know, what, what kind of metal or plastic uh, is, is a form material. We could do an entire hour long session on conducting a root cause analysis. Um, there is a, a, a brief section on it in the manual um, because it is such a big topic. There's a lot of resources listed in the manual. Um, I highly encourage you to have someone on your staff who has done uh, root cause analysis training to some degree. There's lots of different kinds. They're very applicable. They don't have to be necessarily focused on food safety, but if you need a quick and dirty root cause analysis, use the five whys. Um, don't let yourself get stuck on the original question asked and the original answer. Um, get really far down into, um, you know, if, if the answer is, well, this piece of equipment was put together wrong. Well, why was it put together wrong? Well, we had a new maintenance employee working on it. Okay, well, why did we have someone who was a new maintenance employee without someone experienced on it? Well, that person was out. Okay, well, did we train the new maintenance employee? No, well, why? You know, get, get down to really what the root cause is before you can, can understand um, where the incident happened and how to fix it. And I'll touch on I'll touch on this a little bit. Um, I, I know this is a lot of words on a slide, but I wanted to have the, the full context to the best of my ability here. Um, Sean talked about this a little bit. And um, one of the uh, amazing things that we need to absolutely do in every situation is identify: Is this a public health risk, or is it not? Is it a food safety hazard, or is it not? And the thing to remember with for material is you're looking for two or a combination of two possible public health risks. Can it cause injury or is it a choking hazard? So injury, we're talking oral injury or um, internal lacerations from it being sharp or hard um, and choking hazard, we're looking for a certain um, texture, size um, and consistency for that choking hazard to be present. Um, and your intended use is very key. So if this is going to uh, only be served to adults, um, that's very different than something that is uh, you know, a kid product. Um, so the other thing that I'll, I'll, I'll tag here is that you need to consider all of these elements before making a determination. So just because something is the right size or shape to be a hazard, if it's very, uh, if it's very easy to see and it sits on top of the product and someone would very easily identify it before they would consume it, that's different than if it was embedded in the product. Generally speaking though, um, in most regulatory bodies, if uh, if a bore material is hard and sharp and between seven and 25 millimeters, regulators are going to assume that it's a food safety hazard. Um, like I said, there are other things to consider there that you should consider. Um, that's kind of a quick and dirty, hard and fast rule. In Canada, I think it's between two and 25 millimeters. 
and do a risk assessment. Um, again, not every foreign material incident is going to warrant the same response. So if it's uh, for sure a food safety hazard, that's going to warrant a different response probably than something that's not a food safety hazard. Um, obviously, for something that's a food safety hazard, we need to get our arms around the product. We need to make sure that it's not available to customers or consumers. Um, if it's not a food safety hazard, that's when we need to consider what amount of risk the, what the company is willing to take on. And know that you know injuring consumers is not the only risk that you have with foreign material. There are things like brand damage, um, you know, consumer trust, different things like that, uh, supply relationships, especially if this is um, you know, something that you're supplying um, under someone else's brand name, things like that are, are also critical to think about um, in how you respond. And once you have a lot of the information available, you can start trying to think about what your disposition is going to be. And there's kind of the, the top five, um, you know, either you've determined that, you know, all pieces are accounted for or there's little to no risk. Um, so you're going to release the product. You may decide to rework, whether that's by, um, you know, doing internal rework re-metal detecting, sending it through an offline x-ray. Maybe you work with a third party who can do um, some kind of detection for you. Um, maybe you send it for further processing. You know that it's something that you can't um, necessarily eliminate in your um, facility, but maybe a further processor that can sift it or metal detect it um, would be able to handle it. And then there's rendering. I, um, I I always want to put like a little disclaimer on rendering um, because renderers, if you're using an outside renderer, they don't want your foreign material either. <laughs> um, and if you're rendering in-house, um, if it's going to be used for animal or pet food, um, now we have all kinds of regulations around that. So just understand what your rendering process um, or the, your renderer um, that your outside renderer can handle in their system. Um, what will what form material can it handle? What form material may hurt their equipment? Um, and then obviously there's there's uh, actual dis disposing of the product. And not all your product will necessarily have the same disposition. So if you cast a really wide net and through your investigation you were able to say, um, you know, we thought maybe it was a whole production day, but we were able to narrow it down to two hours. Maybe you rework those two hours worth of product, and the rest of the day can get released. Really And this is to score bonus points, but I don't want to diminish uh, the, the usefulness of this um, trend. Use your data. Don't just let, let your data sit there and do nothing. Um, start making sure you document and start tracking your foreign material incidents. Track your internal findings as well as your external. Your internal may be telling you something, um, and hopefully you can identify it before you have an external finding. These are just some of the things that you might want to um, look at tracking um, and trending. Um, there's there's certainly more that you could look at, but these are some things that um, our folks have found valuable over the years. And then um, there are kind of like what I'll call three levels of uh, trying to fix an issue. There's that immediate corrective action. That's the band-aid. That's the we're going to take this equipment out of the room. We're going to um, clean and sanitize the area. Uh, maybe you're going to increase monitoring for a little bit. There, these are things that you're going to do right in the moment as soon as possible to stop the bleeding. A preventative measure is going to be that next level. That's going to be something that um, you're going to take a lot. You take some time. You know, don't rush creating a preventative measure. Um, if you have that immediate corrective action in place, you've bought yourself some time to do a thorough uh, root cause analysis and really identify the right um, preventative measure to use. Um, this is something our folks um, uh, harp on quite a bit. Um, it's true, what we think, as well for training. Training and increased monitoring um, are useful, and uh, there are times to use them. They're not good preventive measures. Um, if you can have a, a hard, um, you know, I, I actually worked at a facility once where we were not ever allowed to use training as a corrective action or a preventive measure. We had to create um, something in process that, that could control um, the incident moving forward. So I increase you, I encourage you to have that mindset. I'm not saying training is never the right answer. It is sometimes. Um, but increased monitoring should almost never be used as a preventive measure. And training um, should be probably an element, but not, not the end goal. And then that next level um, is reassessment. Um, reassessment's not always going to be necessary, but you should consider it. If you've had a similar incident multiple times, maybe it's time to look at your program in general. 
um, or if you've had a significant enough incident, um, either number one, regulatory requirements um, would make you do a right reassessment, but also if you've had a fairly significant incident, that might be a good time to consider reassessment. So I kind of look at this in the same way as um, trying to prevent um, future uh, car accidents. Once the car accidents happened, you need the Band-Aid to put hopefully only a Band-Aid for a minor car accident. Um, then, you know, if you're looking at a way to prevent car accidents, many times you'll see municipalities put in a stop sign. But then if you continue to have um, issues and, and car accidents or so ones that are severe enough, you'll start seeing car manufacturers jump in um, and create things um, like a, a brake assist and lane assist and early warnings and things like that to kind of help um, consumers do better uh, when driving. So uh, think of it the exact same way. There are levels um, to put in place. And then my, my parting thought for you all um, is that, uh, and for those of you that, that work directly in, in the food environment, um, I, I feel you probably have the same thought that I do and that one of my least favorite things ever to hear is, but we've always done it this way. Um, uh, great quote from, from Grace Hopper on uh, the most dangerous phrase uh, in our language. Uh, so I encourage you to, to, again, this is publicly available on our website as well as our partnering organizations. It's out there for people to use, though it was designed for the meat and poultry industry. Um, it has applications elsewhere, um, and we encourage you to, to utilize those resources. Um, there are some really great uh, additional resources and addenda in the back, um, so I encourage you to look at those. I know this was a lot, and it can seem like a lot, um, but again, not every incident will require all of these steps, and these are some really great tools that our mem members put together and that can kind of help you sort through a form material incident. So I thank you guys very much for your time today. If you have any questions outside of uh, this event, you're always welcome to reach out to me uh, at my email address listed here. Wonderful, thank you, Casey. That was an excellent presentation. Um, really great advice and really nice tactical information that attendees can you know, take home with them or if they're home, use when they're at work. Um, so I also, before we jump into the q and I want to remind folks that you can download the presentation from the handouts pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. So please do take advantage of that right now. This, like I said, Casey's uh, presentation had a lot of really useful information and, and some of those links to the resources as well online. So for the first question, this one came up from an attendee um, when you were going through the flow chart of the root cause analysis. So with regards to the use of the five whys in root cause analysis, is it strict in the sense that one needs to ask all five whys or can you do less or more of the five whys? Yeah, the five whys is, um, I, I think they went with five just to challenge you to get past one or two. Um, so you can definitely use more or less. I would try not to use less, but definitely use more if you can. So um, the idea really is to challenge yourself into getting down to what really is the root cause um, versus what's kind of, you know, the, the superficial. Okay, very good. How can one get buy-in from senior management to put resources towards a good foreign material response process? Yeah, that's, that's always hard. Um, you know, doing the right thing often takes a lot of money. <laughs> um, and that's what, that's what we often find. And, and I know it's hard if you're in the food safety or, or quality assurance world um, and trying to get people to focus on, on things like foreign material because it just seems like all you do is ask for money and you don't make any money. Um, but there's two pieces of advice that I can give you. The first is relationships. Do not underestimate the power of relationships. Try and get good relationships with your operations and production folks, your maintenance personnel. Um, have, have those people on your side and seeing, seeing what you're trying to do for the organization first. Um, and then when you go to management with an ask, Show them the money. Show them where this could hurt them. You know, Sean, you know, pointed out recalls um, are, are hopefully not, but um, potentially on the rise, and they're expensive. There's a lot of information out there on how how expensive um, recalls can be. Um, you know, you're not just looking necessarily um, at you know the cost of getting the product back, the cost of you know ruined relationships and the customer supply. You're talking about brand damage. You may be talking about paying someone's hospital bills if it's a food safety hazard. Okay, very good, thank you. So when you went through the steps um, to take with incidents, you kind of had you know different paths of, that folks could go. 
are all of the steps necessary for every incident? No. Um, so again, you know, it's part of the important part of how, having a having a team and doing some triage. Um, first and foremost, especially if you're dealing with a consumer or a customer complaint that's an external complaint, I highly recommend that you have some kind of triage and substantiation um, process in place. Make sure that it's a legitimate complaint um, before you. Make sure it's your product. <laughs> um, I don't know how many times there's been a customer complaint reported and it, it turns out that it was actually someone else's product. Um, so do those kinds of initial steps to first figure out whether you need to respond at all. And then if you determine that a response is necessary, again, you may not need to reassess. Um, you may have, uh, you know, the investigation may not require a records review because you found something during, uh, you know, the floor walk or, or something like that. So, I mean, it just depends. Uh, definitely tailor it to, to whatever is necessary for that incident. Okay, great. Thank you. What is the risk of a poor response to foreign material, a foreign material incident if there is no food safety hazard? Yeah, again, we talk a lot about, um, especially in the food safety world, obviously we're focused mainly on actual food safety hazards that are a public health risk. Um, there, there's a lot of risk from hazards that won't necessarily um, cause injury. You know, maybe it's not a class one. Uh, maybe FDA wouldn't force you to recall your product, but you still could have a, a, a potential for a lot of risk. Um, and, and that's where you need to really determine what you're willing to accept. You could have a monetary risk because you're uh, maybe it's a product that's going to a, a, a further processor, but that further processor is going to charge you back for the amount of time and effort it took to remove the foreign material. Um, maybe it's uh, you know going out to consumers and it's not going to injure them, but you're going to be on TikTok soon with your brand name all over it um, and foreign material being shown in a package. So you have to really think about all of the risk um, that's associated with, especially if you are trying to protect a brand. Right. Okay. Very good. So that takes us to the end of all of our questions. You had a lot of information in your presentation. Um, so I did want to ask you and give you the opportunity if you have any sort of key takeaways that you want to leave our attendees with today. Um, again, I think I just, I, I want to prove Sean wrong. So um, I have full faith in, in both our industry and the, and the food industry in general that, that we can prove him wrong and we can, we can prevent further recalls. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Casey, for joining us today. Thanks, Maria. And with that, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Chris Sawyer. He is the Director of Continuous Improvement at Breakbush Brothers. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, first of all, thank, uh, thank Sean and Casey for uh, what I would what I would consider putting the ball on the tee for me. Uh, I think a lot of what they covered earlier, I uh, certainly found myself sitting here nodding and shaking my head to some of the you know the horror stories, having uh, been in the industry myself and experiencing some of those. Um, uh, you'll see a lot of common themes in in what I talked about today to uh, what uh, what they spoke about. Um, I also like to thank Food Safety Tech and PPO for having the opportunity to speak today. Um, it certainly is an interesting topic. Uh, you know, when somebody asks you to speak about your foreign material challenges, uh, not a lot of companies are going to step up and raise their hand and say, oh, yes, please let me speak about all the challenges I've had with foreign materials. Um, yeah, kind of airing a little bit of dirty laundry, but I think um, I think we have what uh, what is an interesting story, the journey we've taken to improvement and um, some things here that I hope you, you folks can uh, take home with you and learn from, uh, maybe make some improvements in your processes as well. Um, so here is a quick overview of what I plan to cover today. Um, just, a, just a few main topics. Um, but before I do get into those, <clears throat> excuse me, I do want to just give a quick introduction of myself and Breakbush Brothers for some context. Um, so Breakbush Brothers, uh, they are an almost, we are an almost 100 year old uh, family owned uh, further processor of chicken products. Um, we do have uh, four facilities across the United States um, and we are based out of beautiful uh, yet albeit right now chilly uh, and very windy, uh, central Wisconsin, Westfield, Wisconsin. Uh, me personally, uh, I have 20 years in the meat industry, um, most recently in, in my role as, as Director of Continuous Improvement for Breakbush. Um, I spent about half of my career in, in operations quality, uh, the first, first part of my career, um, some time in research and development, and now most recently CI. 
Um, and I have the relatively unique distinction of being able to proudly call myself both a cheesehead and a meathead, um, having earned my master's degree in meat science uh, from the University of Wisconsin. So um, as, you're, as you're certainly aware of by now, um, as discussed by Sean and Casey, um, we certainly have, you know, as an industry, a challenge with foreign material, right? It's, um, it's, it's an unfortunate um, reality in our industry that, that despite all of the interventions we've put in over the years, um, it is something we continue to deal with. And with the heightened, you know, regulatory and public pressure to get things right, um, it's something we have to continue to work on. Um, that's, that's what I love about continuous improvement is, is exactly that, right? We, we don't always have the right answer right up front, um, but we're going to keep working toward, uh, we're getting, keep working toward a, a better place. Um, and despite, you know, a long history of developing and, and implementing interventions, uh, we still routinely hear about recalls, um, you know, for products containing foreign material. And as we've seen that, uh, that as the percentage of total recalls, that's gone up in, in the recent decade. Um, and for those of us that work in food production, unfortunately, we routinely encounter it. Um, you know, it's a headache and a, and a battle we all deal with on a, on a routine basis to try and keep that foreign material out of our processes. Um, <clears throat> there's certainly plenty of examples of what we uh, what we encounter across the industry. I think Sean had a very, very colorful uh, survey of the things that are seen in the industry. Um, but I'm going to stick to kind of what I call with the three main categories as, as I like to group the foreign materials we encounter um, from my, my time in uh, meat and poultry. Uh, so the first one I, I want to talk about is really the most commonly encountered. Um, there's a few reasons for that I'll get into, um, is metals. Um, you know, it, it makes sense that it's the most common we see. I mean, we have in our processes a lot of stainless steel equipment, right? Um, and, and by their very nature, especially in the meat industry, there's a lot of metal on metal contact. Uh, things like grinders, macerators, slicers, we all have that contact. And uh, unfortunately, given time um, or errors by people, so either through misassembly or you know, just good old entropy, uh, we start to see things rub uh, in an unintended way, and that's when we get things that get broken or shaved off and, and they enter the product stream. Uh, the example on screen here would be from a from a wire belt, which which uh, product travels on. Just given given enough tension and stretching and motion over time, we see sometimes the little clips on the ends break off and they end up in our stream. Um, another common metal uh, we encounter is the various fasteners and screws and nuts and such that that hold our equipment together. Again, given given time and motion, they tend to find a way to break themselves loose and and enter the product stream. Uh, the other reason I would consider metal the most commonly encountered is just the fact that it's actually relatively easy to detect uh, compared to a lot of other foreign materials we encounter. Uh, things like uh, metal detectors, x-rays, etc. Uh, make them easier, easy for us to find, so we encounter them quite frequently. Uh, the next most common family I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, Sean, I think very colorfully talked about this one, is what, what I would call inherent foreign materials. Um, you may not deal with this as much in the in the FDA world, but in the USDA world, things like uh, bone and cartilage and feathers are a reality. Um, and I think it's it's an interesting one because there can be that healthy debate over whether or not we actually consider them foreign materials, right? They're they're inherent to the product. Um, you know, I've even heard it said, in, interesting. You know, people say, well, there's always going to be at least some bone in your boneless chicken. You know, muse on that for a little bit. Sounds kind of funny, right? It's boneless chicken, but again, it's inherent to the process. We're not going to make perfect cuts every time. We're not going to contain every piece uh, of 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 the of, of the frame of the animal, and you, you might see some of that in the stream. Um, but regardless of what side of that debate you're on, whether it's truly a foreign material or not, uh, you know, as evidenced by consumer complaints and such, it, it truly is a dissatisfier for customers and consumers. So it, we, we would be best served treating it as such and doing our, our best to keep it out of the product stream, just like any other foreign material. Uh, and then the last category I, I want to talk about is what I would call the undetectables, um, you know, the, the enemy of all of us, right? You've got your plastic, your wood, corrugate, paper, things like that, that, that there's really no reliable or historically hasn't been a very reliable detection system for finding these other than than just visual inspection. Um, I think uh, among the undetectables is my personal nemesis. Um, folks in the meat industry will recognize these. I can't can't speak to others, but the, the good old combo tanner. Um, you know, it's it's got three of my uh, undetectables all in one convenient package, right? We've got the wooden pallet, we've got the corrugate container, and then various plastics, uh, you know, containing the material within, covering it, stretch wrapping it, etc. Um, so this one carries kind of a unique, unique challenge by itself. It's a very convenient conveyance, but also uh, can can become an enemy of ours. 
Um, so what do we do with all of these materials that are out there, you know, posing risks for us, right? Um, I'd like to just take a little bit of time to review kind of the key technologies, you know, historic technologies that have been out there um, that, uh, that I've encountered and kind of the relative advantages and disadvantages in trying to manage foreign materials uh, in our product streams. So the first one uh, I would talk about, I'd like to talk about is uh, screens and sieves. So it's kind of the uh, kind of the lowest tech version that we have, right? It's it's just a, a matter of physically eliminating things. Um, obviously, the challenge here is that uh, they don't work in all cases. Uh, you know, particularly in my industry, thinking about you know wet uh, pieces, wet and sticky pieces of meat, they don't really go through screens and sieves very well. Uh, and uh, the other disadvantage being that they can really only eliminate gross contaminants, right? So I find these work well in terms of um, you know dry ingredients, other good free-flowing materials. Um, but even then, you're you're really only going to find things like big pieces of the bag um, if if it's internally produced, or you know if it comes from your vendor, something larger that 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 screen would eliminate. Um, kind of one step up from screens and sieves would be magnets. Um, it's it's kind of the other end of the spe spectrum where your uh, where the screens are only going to find your larger pieces. Magnets can do that, but also they uh, they're going to they're going to do a good job of pulling out fines and things that that aren't visible. Um, but again, it's it's going to be have limited applications due to you know the ma product having to flow through uh, something that has a magnet in it or flow over the magnet itself. Um, it, it is nice that it's able to pull out the smaller pieces, um, but again, as we discussed earlier, are those at that point are those really a risk? So, um, but I have seen it used most effectively again with dry ingredients, um, you know, particularly ground materials like ground mustard or other spices, where you've got the, you know, you've got the grinder that has that metal on metal that creates those filings over time. Um, or, it, you know, what, what I've seen, honestly, the most uh, beneficial of doing using magnets would be to eliminate some of the larger uh, metal contaminants like bolts or things like that that could then damage downstream equipment. So when you're when you're making a, a you know, chopped and formed product that will eventually get sliced, um, eliminating a bolt is certainly an advantage. So you don't go and further damage that slicer down the line. Uh, next up the line is one that uh, you know we, we we see plenty across the industry would be the metal detector. Um, they have the advantage of being able to find now both um, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, whereas magnets were really limited to ferrous magnetic metals. Um, but a number of of factors in metal detector metal detectors affect their ability to detect things. Um, so the size of the aperture that you pass the product through is a huge determinant in how well foreign materials get detected. So it may be convenient to, you know, only have one metal detector at the end of your process. It's going to be the fastest, most efficient to just metal detect boxes rather than having to have them further upstream. Um, but in so doing, you've, you've seriously hampered your ability to actually detect that foreign material because you've widened your, your uh, zone of detection and it makes that machine harder for it to actually find those materials. Um, another piece that comes into play would be the foreign material orientation as it passes through that metal detector. Um, an example would be something like a long skinny wire uh, it, if it passes through in just the right orientation to where it's passing through uh, lengthwise through that detector, it could be a relatively large piece of metal, but that metal detector might not even find it because it's not really breaking the field that that metal detector generates. Um, that's one that I've, I've actually personally witnessed, and it, it was crazy to see, you know, a fairly good-sized piece of metal that a metal detector couldn't detect, but it, was, it, it went through in just the right way that it, that it, uh, that it stymied us. Um, and then the other challenge I've encountered with metal detectors uh, would be the temperatures and densities of the products themselves can prove challenging. Um, I worked in a process where just a couple degrees fluctuation in the product changed. You, know, you wanted it at a specific temperature for slicing optimization, but that happened to be right at the edge where if there were a couple degrees change, it would kind of change the phase of the product and the way it presented itself to the metal detector. Um, so finding that sweet spot between you know, canceling out the metal detector, not noticing the product, but yet still detecting metal at the at the levels that you want, you know, per your program. Um, it was a real challenge finding kind of that sweet spot and not having to deal with the high degree of false rejects. Uh, one more step up the technology ladder would be the X-ray. Um, and 
Previously, I would have considered this the gold standard, um, but as I get further into the presentation, uh, I'm excited about a new technology that we've started using. Um, but the nice thing about the X-ray is it has all the advantages of the metal detector in terms of you know, the materials that it can find and being able to find relatively small pieces. Um, and it is, and it's, it's even more advantageous in, in being able to find even smaller pieces. Um, it's also able to move beyond metals. Um, you know, higher density materials such as um, you know, dense enough bone, higher density plastics, um, higher density ceramics and glasses can also be found by an x-ray, um, but not all of them. Um, and in, in addition to, um, you know, being able to find those different materials and even being able to find them smaller, uh, we also find that the aperture of the device isn't quite as critical with x-rays as it is with metal detectors. Um, that, that still does come into play, but, but it is certainly x-rays do have, have better and, and broader detection abilities um, as compared to metal detectors. Um, but the, the processing speeds can come into play. Um, you know, we, we happen to have a process where we've actually been able to find you know, pieces as small as one to two millimeters uh, of metal in 40 pound frozen blocks of chicken. Um, but we have the advantage of that being an offline process where speeds aren't quite as critical. You know, if we were to try and do that same thing, uh, pass them through in, a, in more of a continuous process and we had to move faster to keep up, well, now that, that minimum size we could find would certainly, would certainly like, likely step up from what we're able to find today. Um, the other challenges with, X, with x-rays that we found are cost relative to other interventions. It's certainly you know, cheaper to put in metal detectors than x-rays. Um, so it's an investment to, to take that step up in technology and detection ability. Um, the need to have management programs where we're dealing with x-rays. Um, they, they are a safe piece of equipment, but nonetheless, we're required to have management programs in place to ensure that we are keeping our employees safe, um, having those, these machines on site. So it is, it, it is just another thing to manage. Um, and then the other one that I've run into is, is trying to integrate a, a relatively large piece of equipment into existing processes. You know, many of us work in facilities that weren't designed to hold quite so much technology and, and depending on how far one, one piece of equipment is staged next to the, the following piece, whether or not you've even got enough room to figure out where to integrate x-rays um, can certainly be a challenge. Um, so, uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. The other, the other challenge that we've seen with x-rays is um, it is nice that they can detect multiple technologies or multiple items, um, but we have had challenges in finding something. So for an example, with an x-ray, finding both metal and bone. Um, the, you know, there's, you can program the machine, you can put in different algorithms to find those materials differently. Um, and you could try to find that sweet spot in between where you can find both, but unfortunately now you don't find either as well as you'd really like to in very many cases. So you have to kind of, you end up being forced to prioritize what's, what's more important to you, depending on the downstream application or what the impact may be of finding that. So, um, so again, x-rays I think are a great technology, but they certainly don't, uh, you know, they certainly come with their own challenges as well. Um, and I, I tipped my hand a little early, clicked the screen a little too fast. You know, the, the most sophisticated piece of equipment that we have that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is our people, uh, the, the human being. Um, unfortunately, Clark Kent does not work in our facilities, um, so we're limited to the visual surface inspection. We can't see inside the product like we can with, with magnets and metal detectors. Um, so while the decision-making ability of our human workforce certainly surpasses that of equipment, right? The, the, the human brain is, is able to see and interpret and, and respond to things better than kind of the black and white responses we get from our, from our equipment. Um, the, the human certainly uh, presents other challenges as well. Um, you know, the cold truth is that labor costs more in the long run than kind of a one and done technology purchase. We can have a metal detector or an x-ray and it's, it's, we purchase it. And yes, there's some maintenance costs that co costs associated with it, but we don't have the, those ongoing labor costs. Um, and that's even if labor is available, um, as, as many of us have certainly learned through the pandemic, uh, labor ha has been a challenge. So to have enough people on the line to be those inspectors and find those things um, that, uh, that, we, we, that we want them to, uh, to remove them from our processes. Um, and while the human vision is certainly you know, very sophisticated and can tell most foreign materials from products, we're still going to have some that are challenging to see. 
Um, you know, I, one example would be uh, a piece of wood among uh, cooked diced chicken. Those can look very similar in terms of color and texture, and it might be hard for a person to uh, to, to pick out and see while while watching product move by on a belt at thousands of pounds an hour. Um, in addition, people tire. Uh, you know, I, I sympathize. It's it's a very both mentally and physically taxing job um, to stand on the line and watch product go by um, with the with the prescribed uh, you know objective of finding things that don't belong. Which you know, fortunately for us, don't happen all that often. But you have to have that eagle eye and constant vigilance um, to to make sure that you are finding and eliminating as many as possible. Um, and then the most challenging thing that I experience in, in uh, relying upon people to be our foreign material detection is when you have the occasional person who actually undermines the efforts that you've had. Um, you know, things like installation of lock boxes and improved reject handling have certainly minimized this some, um, but you still have, there are still cases where either undertrained or uh, even worse, undercaring individuals can undermine those. You may have some kind of a reject uh, or you know, some type of detection or something that needs to be handled a, a certain way per your protocols, but maybe they they take and shortcut that and put product right back on the line. Um, it's, we've certainly, I've seen that and experienced that in the industry at times, and it, it can be very frustrating um, when, when an intervention becomes your problem. Um, so now that I've kind of talked about, you know, the, the different technologies we have out there, um, I, I want to I'd, I'd like to talk about some of the, the projects that, that we've gone through, um, you know, to try and get ourselves to a zero foreign material future. Uh, you know, un unfortunately, we haven't gotten there, right? And we're we, we still experiencing them. Um, but I did want to share, you know, some of the strategies and projects that, that we've undertaken to try and push ourselves further down that path of, of getting even better at, uh, at finding and eliminating foreign material from, from our product streams. Um, the first major step to take, take, if you haven't already, is to, to make a cultural shift within your team. Um, make eliminating foreign material a priority. Um, it's something that I think we can, we can all take for granted, and especially if we do have some of the, the great technology out there like metal detectors and x-rays, and you know, we just trust that they're doing their job. Um, but if you don't manage them properly, if you don't have programs, if you don't make it a priority, it, it can still uh, be just as big a problem even if you think you're protected. Uh, before I arrived at Breakbush, they had a really great system for responding to events that occurred. Uh, there's a there's a cross-functional team that, that when an incident occurs, they assemble and they assess the situation, um, you know, determine the potential impact and the proper response uh, to what to do in response to that event, as well as talk about, you know, what changes do we need to make in our processes to prevent a recurrence. Um, but while that's a great system, um, as a CI professional, I, I like to be even a little more forward looking. I think this is, it was a, it, it continues to be a very good response system, but it's always a little bit backward looking. You know, it's, it's my objective to try and anticipate and predict what types of challenges may come in the future, um, as well as uh, investigate, uh, you know, what, what might future needs be. Um, so what, what I did was assembled uh, a team uh, to complement that team, kind of a parallel team that focused more on what what technology is out there and what potential problems do we have out there that just haven't exposed themselves yet. Um, so as as Casey had mentioned, we we tap into that cross-functional nature, the expertise that everybody has. We have operations, maintenance, purchasing, um, CI, R&D, others uh, participate in the team. Um, we meet every other week, uh, work through our action register of ideas that we have, uh, we discuss things that we're already aware of, um, you know, challenges that may have happened and, and maybe there hadn't previously been a technology to address it and see what else there is. Um, but again, seek out potential gaps, you know, anticipate where we may see breakdowns in our system looking forward. Um, so I, I'm going to go through a few additional projects um, that actually were generated from this team. Um, so kind of ironically, um, the, the first one that I want to talk about is x-rays. So again, I, I just got done talking about the, some of their shortcomings, but in truth, it, it still is. It's a great technology, and it is an advancement over some of the technologies that were out there previously. Um, you know, it, some of the things that we looked at were straight, uh, either replacement of metal detectors um, or potentially looking at how we deliver product to the x-ray, the speeds that we can run at, uh, you know, the size of the machine. Again, just things that we could do to, to improve our ability to detect with, with using x-rays. Um, the next uh, one that, that we have is trying to, to find 
where we can in our processes to use materials that are easier to detect. To detect. Um, so one of the, the best examples I have of that is actually using uh, metal detectable plastics. Uh, we've done this in a number of our applications, um, things like gaskets, belt rollers, even the belting material itself, you can actually get in metal detectable versions. Uh, generally, this is achieved by impregnating uh, metal filings or metal dust right in the plastic. So, so now you've created kind of an interference matrix of metal within your plastic product so that a metal detector can, can identify uh, th those as a foreign material. Um, and while more costly than the non-metal detectable counterparts, uh, we found that they are a sound investment um, as long as you do your homework first. Uh, kind of a couple key watchouts. Uh, the challenges we've encountered with metal detectable plastics are durability and detectability. Um, so unfortunately, by their very nature, you think about a plastic and what makes it you know, either pliable or strong, depending on what type of plastic you're using, is that it builds, it's a polymer matrix, right? Well, as soon as you start to include metal filings or metal pieces in that, you've undermined the integrity of that matrix. Um, so we have found that metal detectable plastics are often a little less robust or maybe a little more brittle than their uh, non-detectable counterparts. Um, so it does make them more prone to, uh, to breaking or, or shattering you know, splintering off uh, of pieces. So it kind of creates a conundrum of while you've gone and made this material easier to detect, unfortunately, you've also made it easier to become a foreign material. Um, so it's it's a matter of finding that balance um, and, and understanding where it makes sense to use these types of materials. Um, the other challenge that, uh, that uh, we found with some metal detectable materials um, is making sure that you you truly vet uh, whether or not they actually are metal detectable. Um, I think you know many of these vendors will will just call it metal detectable but not really get into the specifics of it. Um, or you know it, you may have to take some of their studies with a grain of salt because I've seen some of them done under very controlled situations. You know they may not speak to how slowly they ran a belt when proving that a certain size piece could be found. You really have to understand all the factors that that affect whether or not a material can be found. Uh, we, we went as far as to actually um, bring in sample materials, um, cut them down into progressively smaller and smaller pieces, and we created a master library of the materials that were available to us and what the smallest detectable piece was in each of our different technologies that we apply. So our various different metal detectors, be they inline or box and x-rays and such, we did a survey to understand how detectable those materials were. Um, you know, it was unfortunately surprising to learn in some cases how big a piece you needed to have to be metal detectable. So while technically, yes, you could call it metal detectable, a detector will find it. Um, you know, and sometimes the, in some cases, those pieces were so prohibitively large um, that they effectively were no better than their, their non-metal detectable counterparts. Um, another big area that we dug into is, as I discussed earlier, uh, you to, to uh, use a, a parlance from the lean world, um, focusing on your intense hatreds. What are those those pains in your butt that, that really cause headaches most frequently, right? The things that you know, if you could just fix this one thing, your life would be so much easier. Um, so the one that I spoke to earlier, my, my nemesis being the combo tainer. Um, from the bottom up, you look at the, the wooden pallet, you look at the, the corrugated combo tainer itself, you look at the, the plastic straps and stretch wrap used to hold them tight, and then the, the poly liners and caps that are in them to contain the material. Great conveyance, um, but every single one of those materials fall under my list of, of undetectables. Um, and by their very nature, just the way that, that you're transporting or handling them, they end up being at risk for damage um, and then introducing some of those foreign materials into the product stream. Um, so we work to work, address both the material itself as well as the handling method to try and reduce um, some of those incidents of foreign materials. Um, the most obvious target for us that we, we tried to tackle first would be the wooden pallet itself. Um, it's one that it, it, it's easy to get damaged as, as it's what's on the ground. You've got forks moving in and out of it. They can bang against each other either on a truck or in your facility, and that's when you start to see little pieces flake off. Um, in addition, you know, some, some folks, some processors will, will take and rack those. So while you've got 
uh, a pallet over the top of another one now is that that may create little fake flakes or filings. Now it ends up in the combo beneath it. So it, it can be a multivariable uh, problem that we deal with. Um, unfortunately, we haven't encountered a lot of luck with replacement options. I think there are good ones out there, but they each come with their own their own alternative risk. So you have to balance out what what risk is is more you know are you more likely to detect and intervene on. Um, in particular, we looked at plastic options, which are generally more costly than wood. Um, and since they get reused, you'd also then have to come up with some type of management program for both uh, maintenance of them, for for shipping of them back and forth, uh, the logistics, um, as well as likely a uh, some type of cleaning program for them. Um, so all of those things are going to, to uh, add incremental labor and cost to your process. Um, and then even worse, uh, the plastic itself can become a foreign material. Um, through, through the process of being handled, again, you can get little splinters or shavings coming off the plastic pallet itself. Um, they, as they get older and wear, you see that even more. Um, we also investigated, rather than using a plastic pallet, going to a full plastic bin. Um, so again, we would still have to have a liner in that bin, but now at least we've eliminated a number of the other, uh, you know, undetectables in the in the uh, corrugate and the shrink wrap and such. Um, and we looked at both molded and collapsible options. Uh, but again, we we have those same challenges of having to take return trips and how do you manage the cleaning um, and maintenance of those bins. Um, and then the kind of the third one that we looked into, um, I've seen effectively employed would be the shipping of product just on slip sheets, so no pallet at all. Um, and while that's, I, I've seen that done and, and done very well and effectively, um, you can really only do that if you have a core set of suppliers that one, even have that capability and are willing to do it. Um, you know, as as somebody, as a company who happens to be spot buyers, uh, you know, we, we purchase from a number of suppliers, but you may also do spot market buys. Um, you still have to have that capability to manage wood, even if you were able to get all of your contracted stuff uh, moved over to to uh, slip sheets. So it's uh, there there hasn't been that, that one solution yet for how we eliminate the risk of pallets. It's just incremental steps in, in the processes where they make sense, trying to, to do things a little bit differently. Um, the, uh, we haven't completely abandoned, you know, looking at alternatives to the pallet. We, there's still other options out there we want to look, but we have found it a better use of our time to actually shift focus to, rather than the material itself, um, the handling uh, and how do we mitigate. Uh, we know that, that those little pieces of wood are going to occur. How do we make sure that they don't find their way to our, to our product stream? Um, so the lowest uh, level investment and hardest to sustain is training. I, I uh, wholeheartedly agreed with uh, with Casey. I liked her statement that um, you know she worked somewhere where they wouldn't allow training to be your corrective action. I think that has to be a part of your arsenal. Uh, but the more that you can apply things like uh, like the good old lean uh, pokeyoka principle to make 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 things error proof, um, that's going to be much more impactful and sustainable in the long run. Um, but nonetheless, we do still have to work with folks. Um, you know, it, it comes, time comes at a premium. Uh, and as a result, you know, people uh, work their fastest, work their hardest, but that's when mistakes are made. You can get careless. Um, I've, see, I've frequently seen pallets either getting pushed into one another. Um, you know, you bump a wall on the way, up, as you turn the corner, you may clip a chunk of the pallet off, um, or you might not fully lift it up. Uh, so now you're you're you know breaking pieces off against the floor. So it's it's really about making sure that people understand what the expectations are, and even taking that a step further and impressing upon them why it's such an important deal, right? Me as your boss, I'm not just telling you to do this because I'm your boss and you have to do it. No, here are the potential impact and and the harm it could do uh, to to our company and by extension potentially your job, right? Let's make sure we do these things the right way so that we don't put put our brand and our consumers at risk. Um, another example would be some simple, you know, lean 5S type solutions um, like painting specific landing locations on your floors. Um, so a specific square where you expect each pallet to be at least gives people some visual reference, um, you know, rather than just putting it in, you know, pushing it into the cooler, setting it down and then pushing it back as far as you can. Um, now that that may cost you a little bit of storage space by making sure you have fair space in between, but I think it's uh, it's one of those where, again, you're making that balance between uh, the investment in protection uh, versus just having a little bit of extra cooler space, right? Um, and again, making sure that people are trained to, you know, how to utilize those tools. Um, we've also done um, some things in terms of implementing some manual interventions in our processes to, to better contain 
uh, the, the occasional foreign material incident. Uh, we've taken to actually wrapping our pallets before we dump them uh, in the applications where it makes sense. So uh, we actually will take and stretch wrap the, the pallet right to the bottom of the combo. So if there are little loose pieces of, of material in that pallet, well now at least we've kind of created a little containment zone for it. So as we lift that that dumping, uh, that, that the, the combo tainer, nothing will come through the pallet or alongside the, the combo tainer. Uh, and we even took it a step further and, and use a unique uh, black stretch wrap. So one, uh, we can clearly identify it as something that came from internal if we have an issue, um, as well as it certainly makes it much more identifiable to our folks on the line. It's a lot easier to find a, a, a black piece of stretch wrap than the, than the traditional clear stretch wrap. Um, and the uh, the other thing that we've done is actually making changes to our dumpers themselves. Uh, we we are really lucky to have a very talented fabrication team in our company that we're able to come up with some additions to our dumpers um, to, to really contain things. I think most dumpers are already designed with with some type of a lip or containment to, to help mitigate, but we would still think, you know, not everything is kind enough to fall to the back of the dumper and in the little the little channels that are already there to capture things. Um, so our team was able to develop things like um, hydraulic rams that hold the liner in place better, um, uh, an HD, um, HM, oh man, I'm forgetting the, forgetting the term for it. Anyway, a, a high density uh, plastic cover to help cover the combo tainer, UHMW, got it, <laughs> um, to cover the combo tainer itself so that things from around the container, you know, just basically have an aperture just above the opening of the combo tainer itself. Um, and for those that maybe aren't as lucky as, as we are to have such a, a solid fabrication team, um, there are, you know, many of the vendors are starting to make improvements in their, uh, their dumpers to help prevent things like this. We've seen one great example out there of, of a breakaway dumper that as the dumper raises, it actually captures and keeps the pallet tipped back. So only the combo comes forward and that pallet itself never gets into a position to where things may, may tip forward off of it. So, um, the uh, the last project I'd like to talk about, um, and, and I do have the title here, "Don't Be Afraid to Fail." As as you can tell, it's a it's a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, and so, by by "Don't Be Afraid to Fail," what I mean is we we have to push the envelope. We have to try new things, and and some of them may not turn out. Some of them may not work, unfortunately. Um, in an ironic twist, we actually bought a, a new pump system with an improved X-ray um, because the old system that we had was was not the most efficient system. Um, it didn't it didn't convey the meat very well. It was very laborious for our for our operators to actually get it to, to pump properly. Uh, a lot of manual intervention was required to keep the stuff moving, um, but also as a result, because it pumped inconsistently, the x-ray was not detecting very well. Um, so it made a lot of sense for us to try and find alternatives that, that would improve our both, both uh, you know, lives of our operators, but also our ability to detect those foreign materials. Um, but unfortunately, uh, over time, when we once we put the the new equipment in place, we found that there was a wear part inside of the new pump uh, that began to wear against the housing. Um, so it started generating shavings in itself. So uh, we were unfortunately faced with the uh, with with the uh, unfortunate irony of you know we put in a new system to better detect more foreign materials, and it started creating more foreign materials in and of itself. So uh, disappointing to say the least, but at least we we. we did, took some step in trying to improve what we were doing. Um, so from there, I'd like to talk about one more project, uh, and it, it would be the um, an implementation of the uh, smart imaging system offered by PNP Optica or PPL. Um, and I'd love to sit here and nerd out um, and go through all the technology, uh, give a dissertation on how it works and why it works. Um, it's certainly something I'm excited about. Um, but it is it is definitely different than than what's been out there to date, um, and to to avoid taking up too much more of your time and and to not steal Scott's thunder, um, I'll kind of just cover the very very top line of what uh, what the PPO machine is able to be, to do. Um, and just to be very clear, uh, this this is not a paid endorsement uh, of PPO. It honestly is. It's a new technology. I think it's a game changing technology that I'm very excited by, um, and I think we'll have. Uh, will have a great impact on the industry if more people are able to, to take and leverage it and see the results that we have. Um, I heard I first heard about PPO uh, about three years ago, um, and as most of these projects do, it started with a cold call, uh, or in this case, a cold email, um, and from to our uh, VP of operations who who very quickly delegated to me, said, hey, this, this looks kind of interesting. Maybe you should check it out. Um, 
And, but uh, as, as both a Gen Xer, uh, yes, I did just give away my age, um, and, and just by my very nature, um, I'm a bit of a skeptic. Uh, you know, I, I remember reading through the literature and thinking, okay, this, this is too good to be true. You're telling me that I can actually reliably find things like plastic and wood just by putting it through this machine. Um, so it was, it was, I was a skeptic, but it was certainly intriguing enough uh, to, to warrant further, further investigation. Um, so in short, the PPO machine works by spectroscopy. Um, so it bombards product that passes by on a conveyor um, with a high intensity, full visible spectrum light. And it actually interprets the reflectance uh, spectrometry information on that product in real time. Um, so intuitively, I, I knew what this meant. It, it's, you know, it's, it's way back in the memory, but from back in my uh, analytical chemistry and physics days, I kind of understood how you could use, um, you know, reflectance spectrometry to chemically characterize things. Um, but it really took a discussion with the PPO team um, for the light bulb to go off. And yes, pun fully intended there. Um, once I realized what it meant, that you know, the fact that we could actually chemically characterize what it was seeing, um, then, then the gears started turning and I had all kinds of ideas for how, how we could use this, um, even beyond foreign material detection. Um, but while I have all kinds of fun ideas of things I'd like to do with it, um, really what it comes down to came down to for us was was the incremental ability to find the things that we couldn't couldn't previously find in terms of foreign material. Um, so since it can truly chemically characterize what it's seeing, it, it actually can find things like wood, paper, plastic, uh, bone, and the other undetectables, things that, that machines to this point have not been able to find. Um, we currently have this installed as an offline process. Uh, we certainly evaluated whether we did it inline, offline, does it make sense to do it at the front of the process, back of the process. We, we had a number of discussions about where it made sense, but what we have found most useful is for it to be, for it to be an offline process um, inspecting incoming raw materials. Uh, what we primarily focus on is trim materials uh, because those end up getting later ground uh, for formed products. So, um, without finding foreign material pri prior to being ground, uh, we can certainly propagate the issue by then reducing the piece size and spreading it throughout a number of batches. Uh, so we wanna try and find and eliminate it before that occurs. Um, however, we have tested it with and periodically run um, all forms of chicken products in terms of be it wings, tenders, trims, whole boneless, et cetera. Um, we've had success with all of them. Uh, we do run at the rather lackadaisical speed of about 18,000 pounds an hour. Um, I, I do say that tongue in cheek. Um, it, it nets lower than that um, overall, but the 18,000 is instantaneous. It only takes us about five, six minutes to get through, a, through one combo container of product. Um, it, it actually could run much faster, certainly if you integrated it with a, uh, a continuous system. Um, there is room on the belt, and, and the fact that what we do is we maintain one-to-one -one traceability. So we take we take a break between each combo to ensure that we're doing one-for-one. -one. We don't commingle pre, uh, product from previous combos. So um, it's it, it's certainly able to keep up with our needs. Um, and we do routine, routinely find previously undetectable materials as small as you know two, three, four millimeters, really small pieces of plastic, even things like um, clear stretch wrap that uh, very difficult for us to find uh, otherwise. Um, again, it's somewhat limited by the speed we run. Uh, like like other technologies, it's the the faster you run, the smaller or the the larger the smallest piece will be that it can find. Uh, as you run a little slower, it's able to to more easily identify uh, smaller pieces of foreign material. Um, now, to be fair, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Um, it's kind of funny. I guess I could say it's rainbows with spectro spectroscopy involved, um, but USDA hasn't approved unicorns yet as uh, consumable. So, um, but anyway, it, it does because it does reflect does detect by spectrometry. Um, it is limited to surface or near, near surface foreign material, so it's not going to see inside the product the, the way an X-ray or a metal detector can. Um, and really, where that's where that's most uh, noticeable would be in terms of like when we run trim. If you've got a lot of small pieces of trim, as they may touch each other, if just by chance that little piece of plastic happened to be between those two pieces, uh, the machine isn't going to see that. Um, but the way that's mitigated, you can see in the picture here, it's actually it's actually a Z conveyor design to where the product will go on one conveyor, 
um, get measured, and then it gets flipped over onto the opposite side, and a second um, a second scanner is right there. So you are effectively viewing both sides of the product. Um, so it's certainly, you know, you're seeing, depending on how, how tightly you load the belt, you are still seeing the majority of the surface area of your products. Um, so it's it's not a silver bullet solution that we'd love like we'd like to see in the industry, but it is certainly a great new tool uh, in our foreign material fighting arsenal. Um, and because I'm sure someone will ask, uh, I won't get into the specifics of it, but very top line, uh, while it is no small investment um, to purchase a machine like this and put it in your process, uh, we have seen enough return on on our investment to uh, to certainly justify that that it was worth taking the step forward and trying something new like this. Um, it was difficult to sell at the front end, you know how to how do you go about convincing an organization to make a pretty substantial investment in an unproven technology like this? Um, but but I will say it has exceeded, it has delivered on and exceeded our expectations on uh, on the, the promises PPO was making. Uh, so with that, uh, just like to go through kind of a few final thoughts, uh, maybe impart a little bit of advice and wisdom that I've gained along the way uh, in our ongoing journey to uh, to try and eliminate foreign material from our processes. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, really focus on culture and your commitment to eliminating foreign material. Um, you know, it, it starts with making sure that everybody's on board with it being a priority. Um, if you don't do that, um, you don't build the culture around that goal, you don't put your money where your mouth is, and you don't truly invest in doing the right things, I think you'll just continue to put band-aids on problems rather than actually heal the wound. Um, use the technology that, that's gonna work best for you. Uh, in fact, use more than one. Um, as I discussed earlier, they all have their relative benefits and detriment. You're not going to find that silver silver bullet. Uh, but I think back to my microbiology days and I think about, uh, you know, you talk about hurdle technology and making making the microbe face multiple hurdles. Um, we can do the same thing here. Do you, do you put, do you leverage multiple technologies either back to back or in different parts of your process where they're going to be uh, most impactful? Um, and then finally, uh, don't let perfect get in the way of just getting better. This is one that I've learned the hard way through my career and at times, and I think it applies here as well. There, there is no perfection, but at least make progress from where you are today. You know, if there are gaps in your system, um, or if there is an opportunity to upgrade technology, um, get more people involved, do that. Um, investigate what's, what's available to you that, that will make you, you know, have you give you a more reliable system for detecting and eliminating foreign material from your processes just keep moving forward um and with that uh thank you for your time thank you chris that was a really great presentation another really detailed one so thank you for that and thank you for your for all your insights um so with that oh we've got some poll launching um so we encourage folks to participate in the poll that'll be up for about 35 more seconds and chris we can just jump right into the q a first question given limited resources in a meat processing line which one will be more effective in your in your expertise metal detector uh technology or x-ray technology yeah i mean i i, I will Given the choice of the two, provided that you have, you know, the budget and the space and all of those other challenges I spoke to, I, I would always go X-ray over metal detector. Um, I, I think we we actually we we have had challenges in the past in certain settings um, where where maybe metal detector is is the better application again, either due to space constraints um, or just the specific application. But I think having that ability to find smaller pieces more reliably um, and the flexibility, again, depending on if you're, you're talking a trim operation where it's most important to remove bone, uh, you know, depending on what it is, I, I think you're going to find that in most cases, X-ray is going to give you just a little bit more of a bump over metal detection. Okay, great, thank you. Next question, what were your greatest challenges and or what would you have done differently in implementing the PPO scanner? Yeah, um, you know, I think for me, it was, it. I don't know that I would have done anything differently. It was more so it, it, knowing more about, um, you know, what the whole process would be. I think, uh, you know, when you're used to implementing things like x-rays or metal detectors, they're really, they're really off the shelf uh, technologies. You can take a metal detector and put it in line and start finding metal. 
Um, the thing about the PPO machine is you really do have to tailor it to, to your process. You have to first establish a baseline and, and through their AI teach the machine what's acceptable. Um, so we had to run, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of chicken through just to teach the machine what it, what chicken was. Um, and then from there, teach it kind of key foreign materials so that it would learn what those are. So just under, having a better understanding of what, what it takes to get there. Um, I think for other folks, the nice thing is we've done a lot of that legwork. Uh, being an early adopter, uh, you know, I think there are some other things that uh, that we found that we could do to, to kind of optimize the way the process works. And, and PPO is doing a really good job of kind of helping us make improvements to our process and to their future machines to make it more off-the-shelf ready for for future future purchasers okay very good and what what has been the overall biggest challenge you faced in your journey towards eliminating foreign material from food processes yeah I, I go back to the undetectables uh, you know it's just that that headache of how do you how do you manage something that uh, whether you're generating it internally or it's coming from the outside either way that we, we know that they're there how, how do you reliably find them and remove them from your process? So, um, you know, I think re relying upon, you know, visual observation and traditional methods is, is really what most people have at their, at their disposal. But, um, but just making sure that you have those systems in place and you recognize that they are more challenging um, and how do you make sure that you can, you at least have some type of monitoring system to identify and react to them appropriately. Okay, great. And the final question, this is a good one. How how did you build the case for investing in a relatively unproven technology? Yeah, that was uh, that that's a, that is an interesting one because first of all, you have to convince folks that yes, this uh, this machine that uh, if you don't understand the technology, sounds like maybe there's some fairy dust they sprinkle on it because why why haven't we figured out before how to find these things, right? It, um, but I think for me, what it came down to was just doing a good deep assessment on the history. Uh, uh, that we had in terms of foreign materials. Take a look at, you know, what were the cost impact of those? Uh, what things incrementally could we find um, that maybe we wouldn't be able to find before? Um, and then from my standpoint, I tend to I tend to always play it a little conservative just to make sure that I don't over over promise what could be delivered and really take that kind of that total and say, let's say if we could even just find half of these, would that justify making this investment? And, and we were able to tip the scale in that favor and say, OK, if we can even just get half. At least it's going to be a worthwhile investment. And then anything above that, um, that's just gravy. Uh, and so it, it, was, it was really just making sure that you use the data available to you to build that case and, and feel good about making that type of an investment. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So with that, um, before I before I make my final thank you to you, do you have any takeaways that you want to leave attendees with? Uh, no, I think really just kind of reiterating the, you know, the things that I gave for advice is just work with the people around you, leverage, you know, everybody else's expertise and build that culture. Um, and then just go out there and try, you know, to, to do something to just keep keep moving forward and and improving your capabilities. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. So uh, we've gone from uh, fingertips and bird feet to fairy dust and unicorn references. So um, thank you, Chris. And with that, I think that's a nice segue into our final presentation of the day. And I'd like to welcome Scott Rutgazer to join us. He is the product manager of PMP Optica, and he'll be giving us an informational tech talk. Scott, welcome. Hi, thank you very much, Maria. Um, so to start, I'd like to thank uh, Sean and Casey and Chris for their for their excellent presentations, and uh, it really kind of highlights the whole uh, uh, the whole problem around the industry about uh, trying to detect and remove foreign materials, uh, what to do in case you get foreign materials, and how to deal with it if you have to do a recall, and what the legal consequences are. Um, so it was very very insightful. Um, just as a quick introduction to myself, I've, I, I am the product manager at PPO, but I've been in the meat industry for the past 14, 15 years. Most of my time has been in food safety and quality assurance with some brief layovers in production and sanitation and uh, product development. Um, for material has been one of the things that has been uh, a negative impact on my existence, I guess, for the last 15 years. Um, so we're talking about uh, a detection system, inspection systems that are taking the place of 
people manually uh, looking at uh, looking at foreign material, looking at product to try to remove foreign material. So you're talking, Chris had mentioned about metal detectors and X-ray machines, but there's vision systems and multi-spectral multi imaging systems and hyperspectral imaging systems. That's kind of the gamut. Um, when you're talking about those, some terminology we need to, uh, to to look at to determine how effective these are. So you have any foreign material inspection system, you have two possible discrete events. You have a positive detection and a negative detection. So the positive detection, I guess the easiest example that everyone would probably have the most background on would be a metal detector. So a positive detection is you, the machine recognizes that there's a piece of metal and rejects it and it goes into your bin and you don't have any problems. And negative would be just good product running down your line with no contamination at all. So of course, things are never that simple. No, uh, no detection device, no inspection system is going to be perfect. So at the end of the day, what you end up with is a true positive, which would be metal being detected and rejected, a false positive, which is when your metal detector thinks there's metal there and rejects your product, but there's nothing there. Uh, true negative detection, which is just your good product running up your line and going into your packages. And of course, false negative detection. And that's the one that really gets you because that's when your metal detector does not flag uh, a piece of metal on your product. And it goes up to, and it goes up the line and goes into a bit and goes into a package. And then you're dealing with recalls and uh, dental bills and, and, and stuff like this. And that's, that's what we want to avoid. So when you're trying to assess your detection technology for these, uh, you know, true positive, true, true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, uh, the only thing you can really assess is your true positive and your false positive. Your true positive, you know, your metal detection rejected, false positive, you go into your bin and there's no metal there. Your true and false negative rates are never ever going to be known. And so you can't tell how many false negatives you have. You get some information back from customer and consumer complaints. You get some information back if, if, uh, if it's reported to regulatory bodies. But at the end of the day, a lot of people will find contamination on their product and just throw it out and not, and so you're never getting the full story. And of course, human factors will inevitably come into play. So when we're talking about detection technology, we need to talk about how to talk about them and how to evaluate what the best detection technology can be. So what you wanna look at is something called the detection curve, which is, an evaluation of what the smallest object a system can reliably detect is. So if you look at our, our graph that we have here, you can see on the x-axis, you have the size of a material, and on the y-axis, you have the probability of that material being detected. And again, the example that is very easy and pops to mind very easily is your metal detectors. So if you have a, uh, a two-inch piece of steel, it's going to reject 100% of the time, but if you have a one-millimeter piece of steel, then your detection chance or the chance of it actually rejecting is going to be very small. Now, we're not really talking about metal detection systems today. We're talking more about vision systems. And, uh, and, st and so we talk about pixel size a lot when you look at it. So you're looking down on a line and you break that line into a grid of pixels. Now, your minimum detectable object is not your pixel size. It's going to be some combination of pixel size, the resolution of what your vision system can see, the background noise, and then system configuration and the product and the algorithms that are used to calculate what is there and determine whether that is, whether it is uh, foreign material or not. So only a detection curve will actually provide you with sufficient information as to what your best detection system can be. Okay, so if you're looking at best performance. It is not going to be the smallest object ever detected. Anyone who's worked in a plant for any significant amount of time will have examples in their head of a time when one of your employees looking at a line picked up, I don't know, a stack of sliced turkey 
and there was a tiny, tiny, tiny speck of blue plastic or something like that on it. And they're talking about how they've, they've, they just found this and they've got it off the line and it's a big deal and they're talking to their neighbor about it. And at the same time, a, a one inch piece of steel rolls up the line and goes into a package because they weren't paying attention. So humans can be the best performance in a single instance, but machines are going to almost always be better because they never stop paying attention. They never daydream. They never gossip with their neighbors or anything, anything like that. So when we're talking about getting towards a perfect detection system and what you want to select as your detection system for your facility, you have to first get as good of an understanding of the problem as you can. So what is the foreign material you're trying to avoid? Now, that is often, as Chris had mentioned in his last talk, that's often a much more complicated question to answer than, than, than you would like. If it was something simple where the only foreign material in your entire plant is metal, then you can pick an X-ray machine or a metal, a metal detector and you can use that as your right approach. However, when you have a whole array of different, uh, a different form materials like metal, bone, stone, plastic, rubber, et cetera, et cetera, picking the right approach can be very challenging. So, and each approach is going to have trade-offs. So a quick example of that is an X-ray machine is going to have very, very good detection for metal and stone and concrete and stuff like that. But it's gonna miss things like plastic, and wood and cardboard that have less density gradient versus uh, versus the, what you're trying to detect. Vision systems, spectrometers can detect plastics and wood and all these things much, much better, but there's a trade-off where it only does the surface. So you have to use whatever is at your disposal to mitigate these problems as best you can. So, and again, often the approach that is becoming much more common uh, in the industry right now is the multi-hurdle approach. And I, I gave a, there's a little example on the slide of this. If you go to the doctor because you have pain in your hand, well, they do an x-ray and there's nothing there. So then they send you for, uh, you know, an MRI on your hand and then they'll send you for uh, an ultrasound. And they do all of the different things to try to determine what is actually wrong. So automating this with a vision system, again, I'm going to kind of buzz through this kind of quick because I don't have a ton of time. Um, but there's camera systems. Now, camera systems use visible light only. So it'll use the three colors, three wavelengths, only within the visible spectrum. So it's very good at seeing, uh, you know, high contrast items. And there's lots of examples of camera systems out there and many non-food applications. There's a wide variety of, of, uh, of knowledge to draw from. But it's not going to see much in the way of chemical information. And I'll touch on again on chemical information as to why this is important upcoming. So multispectral systems, these are newer on the market. Uh, they can differentiate some chemistries and are designed and basically programmed to differentiate specific materials based on chemical information. Uh, and uh, so I guess the best example of something like this would be uh, a benchtop NIR system that a lot of facilities and a lot of companies use to do uh, fat lean analysis. So they are programmed with specific wavelengths to pick out peaks in the spectra that cover fat, muscle, muscle tissue, and moisture, and then they can spit out an answer about the ratio. So they are limited in the number of wavelengths and the information that they can that they can take and process. Now, hyperspectral systems are very new on the market. Now, if you're asking, if you're curious why they're very new, and I think Chris touched on this a little bit, but there's a couple of reasons why they're very new. Hyperspectral systems take in absolutely enormous amounts of spectral data. Okay? And with that spectral data comes a lot of background noise and resolution problems and all that. The founders of PPO originally, when they uh, when they devised the company, and this is going back quite a ways, worked mostly on developing spectrometers for selling spectrometers, not necessarily for the use. So they have worked their entire careers in academia and with the company 
on reducing the res or increasing the resolution and reducing the background noise so that the hyperspectral imaging systems can uh, can pick up all of the information without the background noise. And the other big thing that's the reason why this is new on the market is because comp computing power has really, really grown over the last, you know, so many years. I mean, it's been growing ever since uh, computers have been a thing. I think everyone's heard the analogy of your your cell phone that you have in your pocket has more computing power than what they use to put uh, to put a rocket on the moon. Well, 10 years ago, there would not have been computing power available to process the amount of data that the hyperspectral system requires. So again, you're getting very, very rich, detailed chemical data that gives you a full chemical fingerprint of what you're scanning. Now, why is that important? Why is the chemistry of this so important? Now, uh, going back in my, uh, going back in time to when I was a, a university student, I did a degree in chemistry. Inevitably, at the start of every single chemistry course, a professor will stand up in front of the class and give the tired old line of, what is chemistry? Chemistry is everything. Now, you hear it in every class and it gets, it gets a little annoying, but they're not wrong. Everything around you is made up of some combination of chemicals. My laptop in front of me is made up of polymers. The wall behind there is made up of gyprock. My couch is made of fabric. My hand is made of a variety of, or of organic chemicals. So being able to distinguish between these chemicals is what really sets hyperspectral imaging apart from other systems. Okay. And we are also now using, uh, taking advantage of rapid advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning to allow us to process that vast amount of data in reasonable timeframes. So when you're talking about form material, there's been a lot of talk about form material. If you look at your, the picture we have here, there's form material on these chicken nuggets. So comparing vision systems and how they see this, if you're using a camera system, the data from the camera-based imaging system will only see things in three colors. And so it's very easy to pick out this blue chunk on one product because blue against a beigey background is a very, very high contrast. And maybe in the top right corner, you can see the bit of white rubber that's on that, that other chicken nugget because there's enough contrast between the beige and the white. But there's foreign material on all these things. And a camera system is not going to be the most efficient way of seeing them. When you look at multispectral imaging devices, these devices will see the chemistry, but through very defined wavelengths that you have to program in. So again, maybe you've programmed it to see the chemical signature of your blue plastic or your white rubber in the top corner, but it's going to miss other form materials. And you know, it's not going to be able to tell you the difference between an unknown form material and what is actually on your product. You look at this scan of a, hyper, a hyperspectral imaging system, you can see that it, it covers everything and it shows the entire spectra. And there's a, a massive hundreds of different wavelengths of, of information are being accounted for. And it recognizes you know, multitudes of different form materials at any one time. Sorry. So what's possible with hyperspectral imaging? Now I'm gonna give some quick examples of, uh, and these are real world examples, whether in our research lab at our facility or at a customer site, these are real world examples of things that have been detected by hyperspectral imaging. So you can see on this picture, a little pile of bacon bits on a belt. And honestly, if I just glanced at this picture, I'm not gonna be able to pick up uh, much in the way of anything. There's foreign material on this, but I'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly where it is. Now the machine, once it analyzes it, it'll actually tell you where the foreign material is, but still you gotta, it's, it's, it's hard to tell exactly what we're looking at here. So you zoom in and you can see a little less than two millimeter piece of white rubber sitting on a piece of white fat. Now for a vision system that's looking at color contrast, that would be very hard to pick out the difference. But because a hyperspectral imaging device is determining the difference in chemical signature. It can very, well, I don't wanna say very easily, but it can definitely pick up the differences between just about anything. 
So when you look at the, 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 the scan that shows through on the hyperspectral imaging device, again, you're talking about a little tiny, tiny piece that's there, but it, and it's, it would be very hard to see, even on the hyperspectral scan. Okay, another image in that. So that's a good example of, of, of using chemical contrast to be able to pick out the difference between very small bits of foreign material and the background. Now, this is another example of bone detection. Now, this is bigger pieces of bone, but this is something that our system can also detect. Uh, this is from uh, a, 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 a belt running chicken trim up a line, and you can tell that there's a little circle here and there's an actual metal bolt in there. Now, this is not a real small piece of metal, but when you have everything crowded together like this and there's shadows and all that, these kind of things can be easy to miss. But again, the system will recognize the difference in chemical signature and pick it up. Uh, you can pick up bone, cartilage, and follicle detection. And I'll be honest, on this slide here, the furthest right image, which is a feather follicle with a little tiny, tiny piece of feather left in it, this is something that our system recognized and sorted out. And this is one of the things that got me truly excited about our system and how it works, because that is a very, very small thing to detect and it, it, it's very impressive. Uh, you can measure different quality metrics. Now, woody breast uh, is not necessarily the topic of what we're, what we're talking about today, but as an example, so uh, it's a big problem in the poultry industry. Woody breast, versus regular chicken breast. There's a significant difference between the amount of connective tissue to muscle tissue ratios. So there's much more connective tissue in the woody breast. And normally it's hard to see visually. There are some indicators and there are ways to pick it up and you can look at the, the rigidity of it, which you see on the pictures here. But because there's a chemical difference between connective tissue and muscle tissue, then it's something that can be scanned by the hyperspectral imaging system. So this is what we do at PPO. We, we build hyperspectral imaging systems. And so what is our PPO smart imaging system? So we automate safety and quality inspections. So again, as opposed to using people or other unreliable uh, inspection and detection methods, we, the system will do that for you. And it can also do quality inspection and foreign material inspection with a single system. We can find, as Chris had mentioned, the other undetectables, so plastics, rubber, wood, in addition to things like stone and metal and more common things that are detected fairly easily. They can assess quality in line in real time. So, you know, that lean uh, composition analysis, woody breast and, and so on. So you can assess the quality of your product, not just look for foreign material. Uh, you can optimize your inspections, which helps you uh, maybe reduce a little bit of uh, a little bit of labor, which is obviously a big problem in the industry nowadays. And by using a combination of the patented hyperspectral imaging system, machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, it will allow you to inspect the quality and foreign material uh, and any foreign materials present on your system. So with PPO, quality assessment and foreign material detection work simultaneously in line and in real time on the same system, right? So again, repeating myself a little bit, but I think it's it's something that, you know, the, the range of foreign material that can be detected, as well as doing quality assessment of your product is, 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 a, is a very, very uh, useful piece of the technology. Okay, so... Producers need to optimize everything they do. The, the, the labor, labor costs are rising, the availability of labor is, is, is drying up and it's very difficult to run in a, in a low margin business. So we're using data, not just information. We can reduce the amount of sampling, reduce the inspection of your people, and we can take out opinion-based biased decision-making. Uh, PPO offers real-time production insights and continuous data collection. Now that's, again, versus your human inspector who's going to lose their attention and look away and stuff like that. It offers nonstop good focus. And PPO brings automatic recommendations which enable data-driven, non-biased decisions. So kind of in summary, and again, uh, with when you're trying to determine 
what to purchase for your prospective inspection system, we need to find balance between detection rates and false positive rates. So your detection curves are the best way of doing this. So you want to, you know, you need to find a system that will reject your form material at the smallest size, but also with the highest probability. Your false positive rates are also important because you know you don't want to be losing product that's getting dumped because it's not it, it's not actually affected. And real-time identification and the ability for the system to learn over time and evaluate quality, composition, as well as form material uh, adds a bit of value to the system as a whole doing the job of multiple machines. And I think that's just about it for me. And I think I'm a little bit late. Thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate everyone coming to, the, to this today and for all the other speakers for, for giving me their time, us their time. Thank you so much, Scott. That was really interesting. Um, well, let's let's get into a couple questions. Um, well, first of all, too, um, it was a, it's an interesting presentation. And for folks who want to learn more about the technology, what's their best route of contact for for PMP Optica? Uh, well, I mean, we have a uh, a generic sales email address that anyone can contact at any time. Um, but if anyone's interested, uh, I think uh, Heather from PPO, that our marketing person, is also on this webinar in the background. They can contact me, Heather, or any of our sales team, and we will absolutely get back to people in very short order. Okay, very good. So for the first question, what food products outside of meat have you worked on? Okay, so... Again, I'd like to preface this by saying that like uh, other products that we worked on has been more strictly in a research and development setting, and we haven't uh, we don't have any operational production systems in the field. But uh, again, as I talked about chemistry and the importance of the of uh, of chemistry being the distinguishing factor of what it can do, there's a wide range of plausible things that you can do with this. We've evaluated uh, using the machine to scan spinach for freshness. And in the process of doing that, also stumbled upon uh, sorting out little tiny green bugs that were the same color as spinach. Um, we've done uh, potatoes uh, for you know foreign material in and around potatoes. We've done peppers where compromised skin can be an indication of mold growth within the pepper. And we've done some foreign material detection um, studies around cannabis production. So, uh, you know, but this is not uh, any stretch of the imagination, the limit of what the technology can do. Because again, any difference in chemistry can be detected. It just needs the, the time for the, uh, the machine learning and the AI systems to, uh, to be trained on it. Okay, that's really interesting. And so what does a facility need to do to install your system? Well, and I think Chris definitely touched a little bit on this during his talk, so I don't think I need to go into too, too much detail. Um, but uh, the most important thing is before any agreement is in place or before a machine comes to your facility is there has to be uh, you know, a fact-based decision made on where it goes within your facility. And again, if it fits and all that, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things like that. And then the machine itself will be configured to succeed in the environment and then have it ready so that our software team can start training the AI models once it's put in place. So uh, there's a, there's obviously a sales process. I don't I don't need to talk too much about that. But once it's once the system is purchased, you know it's configured to the environment that you work in, and then our software teams and our hardware teams are ready to modify and configure things once it's installed in your plant to ensure that it's working as soon as possible. Okay, great, thank you. So with that, do you have any closing remarks or takeaways that you want to leave our folks with this afternoon? Uh, nothing in particular. I've been dealing with four material problems for my entire career, and uh, there is, uh, there's no perfect solution. There never has been. Uh, and usually the more, uh, the more things you can put in the way and the more things you can, the more hurdles you can put 
in front of it getting into your product, the, the better off you're going to be long term. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Scott, for joining us today and, and giving us that really informative tech talk. I did put the contact information for PNP Optica in our chat box. So folks, if you want to reach out to Scott or any of the folks at the company, you can reach out to them at sales at ppo.ca. So once again, thank you, Scott. Thank you to thank all you of our speakers today. That was a really, this was a very robust event, I have to say. Um, we had really strong attendance. We had really strong speakers and informative presentations. So folks, within the next minute, please do download the presentations if you have not. This webinar was recorded, so it should be available on our website within 24 to 48 hours, and you'll be able to view it on demand on foodsafetytech.com. You could go under the events and webinar section. You'll also be able to browse the previous events, we've done a lot this year um, on foodsafetytax.com, and we do have one more webinar this year, and that'll be tomorrow, so check that out if you're available. So again, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to PMP Optica for sponsoring this webinar and for their support throughout the year. Thank you to our attendees, and we hope to see everyone virtually soon. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs>